welcome to this uh, third summer school on high performance and disruptive computing in remote sensing. And I would especially like to thank the organizer, Gab organizers, Gabriele, Dora, and all people involved in doing this here in Iceland. And uh, we are very pleased about that. My name is Jonat Lebenvitsson, and uh, I'm rector and president of the University of Iceland. And we are here on the campus of the University of Iceland. And you see the main building there, it's highlighted there. This is an actual photo, but that's how it is. Um, and uh, taking here during the summer a couple of years ago. So uh, what I will talk about here today is uh, a few things. I will talk about uh, the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society, which is uh, a sponsor here, and this is uh, organized under, under their umbrella, we can say. I will also talk about uh, the University of Iceland, tell you a little bit about, about the university. And again, we are very, very happy to be involved in this important summer school. And finally, I will discuss uh, HPC in remote sensing. So uh, first about the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society. I used to be a president of this uh, society and that's uh, a few years back in 2011 and 2012 and I can tell you uh, as a young researcher it was one of the most successful moves I make in joining the geoscience and remote sensing society most successful moves I made in my career but let's just start by talking about IEEE IEEE is uh, the largest academic and professional society in the world with over 430,000 members in 160 countries. It's an international organization, although it was founded in the United States. And these technical societies there uh, are sort of, we can say, the core of, of IEEE. But uh, I joined IEEE as a student member way, way back in 1982. And that was another successful move because uh, here in Iceland, uh, I mean, things are different now. We were isolated, but getting connections to, to the international arena was very important. And uh, Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society is uh, one of these 39 societies, and it was founded in 1961. And uh, it's doing very, very well. Uh, it uh, has a network. We can say it is a network of uh, people from all over the world. It has now more than 5,000 members in 94 countries. And it is uh, both, uh, we can say, uh, in the sort of a network all over the world, but it also has regional activities. It has 69 chapters, which are societies that are located in specific regions. It has 22 student chapters. That's uh, something just related to students to help students sort of organize and get connected and distribute information. And then it has 11 so-called ambassadors all over the world. So if we look at this society, uh, Often when we think about it, it is based on the publications, and I will dwell a little bit on that. Then we have conferences. Um, the largest conference is ICARS, uh, the International Geoscience and Remote Sensing Symposium, which uh, we are attempting to bring here to Iceland in 2027, but it will be held now in Pasadena in California in July. Then we have professional activities, um, and uh, that is related to, we can say, career development of people, senior membership, fellow members, and so forth. Then we have education activities uh, where we have uh, prepared programs to educate about uh, topics related to geoscience and remote sensing, and then technical activities. And what we are doing here today is sort of a mixture between technical activities and education. And uh, relating to the technical activities, uh, there are several, several uh, technical committees uh, 
that the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society has organized. And uh, going back in history, I remember when they were the first three technical committees were announced in 94. Uh, that was actually at ICARS in Pasadena in California, the same location um, like to uh, this year. And that uh, is when I joined uh, the Data Fusion Technical Committee, and I later became chair of the Data Fusion Technical Com Committee, and I found it very, very important and interesting for my career. But here we are working within ESI, which is the Earth Science Informatics. And when we talk about geoscience and remote sensing and all the data, science and information is so important. And what you are talking about here is related to HPC and everything associated with that. But uh, this is a very important committee. So Gabriele, thank you and Dora for organizing this. Uh, when we look at the uh, technical publications uh, of uh, the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society, they are many. Uh, the flagship journal is a transaction on geoscience and remote sensing. Uh, but there are several others that have been um, uh, published. And now, uh, since uh, maybe five, six years ago, uh, a, a magazine, which is the Geoscience and Remote Sensing magazine, has been published, which is more, um, we can say, uh, uh, overview articles, but very readable. When we can say IEEE uh, transactions are more theoretical and then we have other uh, journals that are more applied we can say the magazine is something that uh, is very readable and gives uh, us overview so uh, here's a list of topics i will, will, will not go into why joining the remote geoscience and remote sensing society and i think i have uh, told you i think it was a very important career move for me to join and i have made most of my professional network uh, through the society both in terms of uh, uh, we can say technical activities and also in terms of publications i strongly recommend that you join the geoscience and remote sensing society and as students uh, you get a lower fee and uh, this in my opinion, could be a very, very good move. So if you uh, want to uh, join, um, you can use this uh, uh, to join the GRSS, what you see there on, on the left, and then to subscribe to the e-newsletters, the GRSS uh, publishes, which is free of charge. You can also just uh, take a picture of what we have here on the right. So briefly about the University of Iceland, because I'm so proud to have you here, just to give you some information about the U University of Iceland. It was uh, <laughs> founded 50 years prior to the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society in 1911, but it has grown quite a bit to become, we can say, uh, an international research university, now having been in operation for 112 years. And... Uh, if we just look at the statistics, uh, we have about 15,000 students, uh, 9,500 undergraduates, and then the rest is uh, masters and doctoral students. What I would like to highlight is that uh, doctoral education here has been growing quite significantly. And uh, when I look at the statistics, I can tell you that uh, we have seen uh, from the beginning of this century, which is way back for most of you, uh, uh, we have seen 22-fold uh, increase in the graduations of doctoral students. We used to have maybe something like four or five at the turn of the century, but now we have something like 90. So uh, it has been quite significant, and the number of international students has increased quite significantly significantly and these are not the most up-to-date numbers but uh, this uh, uh, just goes to show that uh, it is quite uh, the high number is high and it's reaching 2000 now we have uh, teaching and research staff uh, about 13 uh, 1300 and then we have uh, other staff members 
And uh, the overall strength of the university is ranked among the best universities in the world by respected publications. And it is included both in the Shanghai and Times Higher Education rankings and also in the World Societal Impact rankings. And we have a number of fields um, and uh, faculties that are highly ranked. We run a center for remote sensing that has been um, ongoing for now close to 10 years. Um, and uh, the original idea behind that was that uh, we have engineering and we have uh, science, geoscience in particular, and we wanted to combine or join forces there. Um, and in the engineering, we focused very much on data analysis and uh, like HPC uh, in, in, the, uh, in the geosciences and the sciences, we focus very much on geosciences, geography and uh, processing of data. And here, for example, in Iceland, we have had significant volcanic activity um, and uh, it is important for us to uh, use this interdisciplinary platform. And then we have courses, and you may not see this here, but uh, we will distribute these slides after the meeting. So that is there. Just to give you an example of the rankings of the University of Iceland, uh, we have seen in the Shanghai ranking that the electrical and the electronic engineering is highly ranked, was in 2021 in uh, place 45. And remote sensing has been also highly ranked, has been from uh, 10 to 6 uh, in the recent period. And I think it's currently number 8 in the world. International collaboration for us is extremely important. And uh, the University of Iceland as a whole has many agreements. Uh, we are also a, a European university as defined by the new European Universities Program. Uh, and we lead. Uh, a program called Aurora, but uh, we have very strong uh, connections both uh, to North America, Europe, and all over the world, I, I would say. But here, in terms of uh, remote sensing, here are, uh, I would say, some of our major collaborations or, uh, or institutions we collaborate with. But uh, for us, because we are relatively small here in Iceland, a very small society, we definitely need uh, international collaborations. And I'm very happy to see you here all uh, today. And if we just look at the Icelandic HPC community, uh, it is uh, very much uh, growing and has been very strong uh, of late, I would say. And this is something I feel as the rector of the university is a very important topic. And um, we are here at Groska on the campus of the University of Iceland, which is uh, a new innovation and business growth center on the, in the uh, region of the science park of the University of Iceland. And I will not go into that, but I highlight this because computer science here at the University of Iceland is there on the top floor. So it's just when you enter the building, well, go inside here, what is behind me, you see. Uh, uh, the building as a whole. And uh, the HPC community here, and the, what we have here is a uh, part of Euro uh, NCC, National Competence Center. And uh, it's, it's a, as you see in the map, it's a link uh, or a network of several centers at the European level. And the uh, center here in Iceland is here. So again, uh, international collaboration is very, very important, and we are very happy to lead this. And if we look at simulation and data in remote sensing, uh, we uh, collaborate with the Julich uh, Computer Center in uh, Germany, and uh, Gabriele has a joint position there, and Maurice Riedl, Professor Maurice Riedl, uh, came from Julich to Iceland and uh, is professor here at the University of Iceland. But this is uh, a very important collaboration. Uh, HPC is so, we can say, it's cross-disciplinary. It's not only focused on remote sensing, but since we are talking about that here, I highlight it. But uh, the collaboration with ULIG is vital for us. 
so we are very pleased with that. So just to uh, sort of finish this, we can ask why using high performance computing, uh, we can say first benefit is faster training of AI models. Uh, and AI, as we know, is uh, growing in importance, and that means speed up. And what do we mean by high performance and supercomputing? It is all of those things. It's a very uh, multifold issue, and you will be discussing this here for the next four days. And uh, uh, I'm very impressed with the program. Uh, I would like to take this course, but I'm not. So um, it, it's important, but there are so many things involved and you will be discussing some of these and even more. But uh, we can say with uh, the uh, increased use of AI, and it is now in the uh, news every day, and that will only increase, what we have seen in the past in terms of, for example, neural networks that it has always been this interplay between the data, the algorithms, and the computer power, computational power. And this has been holding hands forever. And what we see now is that if we have large data sets, we have complicated algorithms, we need, the, we need the strong computational power. But uh, in order to be successful, we also have to need to have algorithmic solutions for this, uh, for the uh, uh, high performance computing. We can say for the for the strong co computational power in order to be successful, and that's what we want. We we need big data to be successful, and we want high accuracy, and that needs to be solved in a relatively short time relatively that's the key thing here because uh, this can take time and we are comparing something that can take months to uh, to uh, train data but we want to be successful in reducing the training time but we know with uh, large data sets we need uh, significant uh, training time but we want to have to, to improve this interplay between the high performance computing and the data and get the best results. So uh, regarding summary and outlook, look at this down there. There's an urgent need of more HPC experts on the intersection of AI, HPC, and specific scientific and engineering domains. Uh, so what you are studying here in the summer school is extremely important for the future. And uh, although we are focusing on remote sensing, and that's very important, we can also extrapolate into other fields because uh, we are talking about the use of data. So there is need for science and engineering. There is industry usage of HPC that can be advanced. We can say that is the mindset we need to have. The landscape of HPC gets increasingly com more complex, we can say, uh, as we go along. And uh, there are large interdisciplinary teams that strive. And that is what we can relate to the skill set. And uh, then if we look at the, the tool set, there's a wide variety of great tools that ex ex exist for HPC. And mastering the tool set is not trivial. And that what is you are working on here to be more competent because I think uh, this is the future. So thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to speak to you this morning and good luck with uh, summer school. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. And thanks for, for being here. We are very happy to have you all here. All the uh, First of all, to all the students, thank you for uh, joining us. It was very difficult to select the persons who, who are here because uh, we had many, many applications. So uh, it's fantastic to have you all here and have interest in this third summer school on high performance computing and disruptive computing and remote sensing. Uh, first of all, I, I have to say thank you to, to John Adley, the directorship of this university who has support us uh, and in general to the University of Iceland, and of course, mainly to Gabriele, who is the spirit of the summer school, the main organizer, and who is uh, trying to, 
to uh, move all the things in order to, to have this summer school today and to all the persons who are collaborating with him to beat with the technical support here. Uh, and uh, thank you to all the teachers who, who will be here during these days. It's very important for us to have this uh, exchange of experience with the teachers too, and to have this uh, network of connections as uh, John Adley uh, said before. Um, I'm Dora Blanco. I'm here uh, as co-organizer of this, of this summer school. Um, because uh, Gabrielle proposed me to uh, uh, form a group uh, inside uh, GRSSS uh, related to this relationship between remote sensing at HPC. And uh, we consider that it was a very good opportunity and, and GRSS uh, is supporting us. So we are very grateful with, with uh, the society. Uh, I come from Spain. I come from the north of Spain, the, the west north uh, of Spain, uh, from the University of Santiago de Compostela. Um, it's an uh, old university, uh, 500 years old, um, and we have uh, there are different uh, disciplines uh, from uh, languages to engineering, but specifically we have physics, engineering, in in different specialties, but basically um, I can uh, summarizing, I come from the CTUs, it's a research center uh, at the University of Santiago, an engineering research, research center. And uh, we have here some numbers related to our activity. Basically, we have here the numbers for uh, the financial support for the last year, but basically we are 140 people working in different subjects related to uh, engineering at different levels. Uh, I will explain more details, but we have opportunities for postdocs and for students. We have a program with uh, uh, financial support for one month uh, during the summer uh, for students interested in working in different disciplines, including remote sensing and HPC. So if someone is interested in visiting us, we can, uh, you can ask me and I can share with you all the, the information that is available in our website. Well, uh, as teachers, we work in different uh, scientific areas. Uh, they come from uh, the branch from high performance computing, for example. We, de we develop devices for, for computation and we uh, also work on computing at different levels, trying to support uh, other uh, research areas. For example, the area of remote sensing, computer vision, language uh, technologies, but also uh, work in machine intelligence. And we also work in natural and artificial intelligence related to um, different uh, topics. And um, we try to um, promote uh, uh, as, a social, economical, um, ethical, and political balance in the development of, of our uh, tasks. I work in the fields of high performance computing and remote sensing. Uh, so um, this is um, the area that I'm going to explain br briefly in, in, the, in the next slides. Well, I'm head of one of the groups of uh, working in, in APG, HPC and remote sensing, one of the research groups at the university. We are um, a group of persons. Some of, of us are in this in these uh, photographs. Uh, I try to um, reflect uh, uh, some of our activities. For example, Gabriele is, uh, is with us in one of the photographs in, in one of the PhD committees a couple of years ago. We have here some of our PhDs um, and uh, some visits, for example, we have uh, Mauro Dalamura for, uh, in one of the photographs and um, Antonio Plaza from the University of Extremadura, who is a very relevant researcher in the, in the area. We have working. Uh, we have working in remote sensing during the last fifteen years, um, and during this time, uh, we had uh, seven PhDs. And at this moment, we are two senior researchers and five uh, young researchers, and we have five PhD students and different master students, different uh, different activities, uh, as in is saying as in any other uh, research group. If you are interested in knowing us, uh, please uh, tell me and we can uh, find out possibilities to, to 
interact. Well, behind all of this, uh, we are talking about remote sensing. All of, all of us know perfectly uh, what remote sensing is, but basically we try to observe uh, the earth uh, without having physical contact and we have we can observe uh, the the earth from uh, a high distance for example from a satellite or uh, at a short distance for example using a drone in the case of the observation of the earth and this allows us uh, to uh, explode remote sensing that differ for different applications, but, uh, mostly during the, uh, during the last years because uh, the sensors are more affordable during the last years uh, due to the uh, evolution of the technology. So it's possible uh, to buy a sensor, a multispectral or a hyperspectral sensor without a, a very expensive uh, they are not very expensive, so it's possible to apply uh, remote sensing information uh, from the point of view of small companies, but also from the point of view of big institu institutions. And it can be applied for planetary observation and to interpret this information uh, related to climate change, earth observation, air traffic control, uh, or with different uh, applications and purposes. You know some of them. We, we talk during this day of all their, during these dates of all their applications. And um, in general, uh, to all uh, the tasks related to uh, the observation and the tracking of the, of the earth. Well, we also can uh, divide the, the approaches uh, for Earth observation uh, depending on the uh, complexity. And because we can uh, basically think on uh, local solutions, for example, a solution for a company, for a group of users uh, that uh, require a short time of response. For example, observing bingers like in the photograph uh, on the left, or for example, to help uh, um, a, a, in the agricultural sector to uh, change crops or to um, measure the evolution of the crops or to uh, keep the crops safe. Um, this is an exa a typical example of a short time of response, but also um, is an example of working with a low, uh, I, I, a low amount of information. It's not necessary to uh, use uh, computational um, platforms, uh, very expensive. Uh, it's uh, usual, it's enough with a CPU or a GPU. And in general, these small companies use only uh, affordable um, platform computing platform computers. Uh, the second example in the in the in the center of the image is an example um, we have worked on is this is the region of Galicia where I, where I came from and this is the study of the rivers uh, in Galicia it's a regional uh, application so uh, the the scope of the application is regional or, or national this is uh, this requires a medium time of, of response and we need mm, uh, more expensive computing platforms to solve this problem we need to to fuse information from drone, from drones and from satellite, trying to um, uh, give us a, a solution to the persons involved in the management of the rivers in Galicia, and we try to uh, predict uh, the behavior in the future. So it's a, a wider uh, view of of uh, the remote uh, system application, and uh, the the last uh, case of increasing complexity is on the right part. This is, for example. Uh, the, the example of the planetary computer, uh, the project uh, developed by, by ESA, uh, is the case when we need to give global solutions involving all the planet, trying to understand the future, to act in the present, and to produce solutions uh, for the future. This is uh, an example of problem that requires uh, in fusing information for, um, from many sources, uh, pro producing solutions with uh, uh, a clear uh, influence in the, in the future. In this um, 
in this uh, classification, we at CJUS work mainly at short and medium um, increase, um, complexity uh, levels. We work, for example, in, in problems like this one. Um, we try to, to, we work basically with the multi and hyperspectral sensory imaging, and we integrate information from different sources, uh, information from the technical persons involved in each, in, in every problem we, we work on. And we have a strong focus on monitoring agriculture and natural ecosystems. Um, we are very concerned with the future of the planet, so uh, we are very interested in uh, trying to track uh, natural ecosystems. And in this case, we can see an example. Uh, on the left, we, we are planning some uh, flights with drones in, in, in a river in Galicia, uh, one of, of the rivers we have studied. In the center, we have an RGB image of, of, the, of the river. Um, and on the left, on the on the right side, sorry, we have a classification of the elements that are important for us. We work uh, with experts in the field trying uh, to detect alarms, uh, to go to the river in person, and uh, to uh, maintain an inventory of the vegetation vegetation species. Um, it's um, a requirement for complying with the European. Um, rules regarding uh, water sources. Uh, so it's very important for us to give a, a solution in a timely manner, trying to monitor these natural ecosystems. And obviously it's necessary to compute all this information uh, using uh, high performance computing platforms. We use uh, for this for this example in particular, it's really computing using GPUs and, and multi-core CPUs. And it's very important not only uh, to, to, to give a solution, but also to give a, a solution as, as, as quick as possible. Well, um, we we also uh, trying to solve these kind of problems. We need to to face different uh, stages on the work. We work on planning uh, the problem, capture analyzing the situation, capturing the information, uh, then pre-processing and um, storing the information, registering, for example, the images using different algorithms. Um, we develop different algorithms trying to solve the different stages for solving the problems. For example, in this case, we can see on the left uh, an, uh, a picture on the ecosystem. We have to consider the ecosystem, the different elements uh, implied in the ecosystem. And uh, we have some drones um, trying to detect the threats that are represented also in the figure. Uh, basically, due to the uh, human action, there are some um, irregular buildings, some invasive species, for example, that need to be detected uh, to take care of, of the situation. Then we preprocess the, pre the images, extracting uh, special information, fusing our information with the information from the technicians, uh, registering the information, storing, and, and try to, to access to the information uh, very, very quickly. And, and then we, uh, the biggest part is the solution. Uh, we have to uh, develop algorithms for anomaly detection, uh, for change detection, for classification, uh, for domain adaptation, to, for the different steps involving in giving a solution uh, to the experts. For example, in, in this case, we can see here um, Rhys Began, uh, um, a gang, um, a gang, um, network deep learning network that we have uh, published a couple a couple of weeks ago uh, it's very important to to take profit all the of all the technologies available for solving the problem so machine learning and it's specifically deep learning uh, it's it's a very good tool at this moment and we are working developing solutions using this kind of techniques in this context, uh, we are capturing uh, huge amounts of information. This is an example of uh, we can see we can see here uh, the capturing uh, of information from satellites. Uh, in this case, we are seeing some numbers uh, related to the satellites in 2022, and we have here some numbers. It's very big, the number of uh, the of satellites that are at this moment observing the Earth. So we have many sources of information. 
and the number of persons who are using this information is, is increasing every year. We can see some numbers here. The uh, amount of information available to the researchers is very high uh, to the companies and the number of publications of uh, schools of uh, technical meetings related to remote sensing is increasing because it's a very, very powerful tool for all, us, for all of us. And the person who are involved in the organization of this summer school are convinced that it's, that it's a, a solution with a strong uh, weight in the future of, of research because it's related to many, many fields. It's a multidisciplinary uh, point of view of, 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 of the future, fusing ecology, computation, remote sensing, mathematics, physics, many, uh, many fields. So it's uh, very interesting for the future. In this case, for example, in the case of ESA, we, you can see the different, uh, the different missions uh, that, were, uh, that uh, were launched during the last uh, 40 years. Uh, trying to understand the complexity of the planet and the complexity of the relationships uh, between elements that at this moment we are uh, in a position to, to analyze. In particular, uh, the Copernicus Sentinel data is uh, one of, 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 the, of the projects uh, that is uh, in this moment available. Uh, we can see uh, some numbers, for example, the, the volume of data that has been downloaded from, from this uh, hub. And we all have worked, for example, with, uh, I'm sure that uh, all, most of the persons here working, working here uh, is in, are involved with, um, with data obtained from Sentinel-2, for example. We have read uh, papers on data obtained from Sentinel-2 mission, I'm sure, and with other, with other missions. Uh, and in this, uh, this field of, uh, of air observation allows the possibility of expanding a market that has to be uh, with developing, uh, development of uh, space infrastructure with the uh, um, uh, storage and management of data, make the data available uh, to the users uh, in a proper way, in an easy way, in a transparent way, um, and also uh, giving value to, to this data, adding and developing services uh, to give value to, to all this amount of data that is collected. That is our, our uh, main objective. And it's interesting that uh, this data, um, this huge amount of data that is collected has some um, uh, features that are uh, very specific and, and go beyond uh, big data because the data is high dimensional, but it's very complex. Uh, there are complex relationships between the information that is captured. It's uh, the problems uh, to be solved are very complicated. Uh, the models are complicated and uh, we have uh, uncertainty because uh, as a, as a, we all know we have lack of data in, in some points and it's necessary uh, to, to uh, rec recover this information, recover from data errors, and we have to lead with all these particularities of the, of the remote sensing data in a good, in a good manner. So um, this problem of Earth observation poses a challenge for HPC and for big data too, in particular. And obviously, machine learning approaches and deep learning approaches in remote sensing uh, are very used uh, tools, are, especially during the last year. We can see in the graph on the left that the number of uh, um, publications in uh, deep learning and, and machine learning applied to remote sensing has increased very sharply during the last uh, two or three years. And it's increasing too at this moment. Um, it's very interesting because uh, the number of publications um, on uh, classical techniques has been reduced a lot, and the number of uh, publications using deep learning techniques at different levels has increased uh, very quickly. So uh, this is a, a, a a very, very powerful tool that uh, it's necessary to know at this moment if one uh, has to, want to, wants to be in, in the field of, of remote sensing. For solving all these problems, we can again um, 
we come back again to uh, high performance as disruptive computing because we need super supercomputing. Gabriele will talk us about uh, the capacities of the Ulic Supercomputing Center. For example, in Galicia, we are working with the Galician Supercomputing Center uh, uh, with different supercomputers. But in some cases, supercomputers are not a solution because there are big infrastructures. So it's necessary to use specialized hardware computing. Uh, in the case of deep learning, it's necessary to use the GPUs in order to have an, accelerate com an accelerated computing. Uh, the new quantum computing, the new paradigm of quantum computing is gaining more and more importance and every university all around the world uh, is working uh, in some way, in, in, in any or, or, or other aspect in quantum computing in the field of remote sensing is a very promising field too. Edge, edge computing, computing in the place uh, when you are obtaining the data, uh, for example, uh, comp uh, computing a solution uh, on a drone, trying to uh, taking decisions, to making decisions uh, on in, in real time is another possibility. Also, cloud computing, we will see some some approaches there in these days. Blockchain and all and, and other uh, disruptive and, and new. Uh, computing techniques are very, very relevant uh, for the field of, of remote sensing. Well, um, in, at this point, uh, Gabriel will continue with, uh, with the presentation and we will, he will explain also uh, the schedule for, for these days. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dora, for opening this part. I think it was a good introduction to create the context for this school. Uh, we assume that obviously you are very familiar with remote sensing. This is not a school where we teach remote sensing, but we uh, a school is a school where we want to uh, start from a real challenge set of applications for remote sensing and then explain possible solutions coming from uh, uh, different computing technologies. So if I come back here to this slide, um, uh, let's sort of come back a bit to the history. So you all know probably that one of the big breakthrough in computer uh, in computing happens in the mid of cent in the mid of the uh, 20th century with invention with invention of the transistors. And also the development of superconductor uh, technology was the basic foundation of our um, classical computer. So by now, if you just look at your smartphone, uh, you have in a range of 13 billion transistors, right? So this is something crazy. Uh, also, when compared to, for instance, the power of computers that we had in 1980s, right? So the, the, your laptop, your uh, smartphone is much faster, that's for sure. Still, com computing paradigm are evolving. Um, uh, so they're moving targets, right? So in particular, emerging quantum, emerging, sorry, computing paradigms are challenges are challenging traditional computing models in various fields, especially uh, in, in challenging scientific fields like in remote sensing, meaning that uh, we'll see that ongoing research and activities will actually uh, push forward uh, advances and research in also in this, in this domain. Now, if you know, just open your phone, check the news, we know that the most breakthroughs required uh, computing power. We know that you know for using the models. Like let's talk about. I will talk about uh, GPT later on. But basically, in order to achieve the results, uh, computing HPC was there to the rescue. Um, these are I just select few of the main. Let's say uh, one of the main achievement done in different fields. Not so not only on the language processing but also in imaging, stable diffusion image understanding and image generation, very important, but not just images, uh, not, not, not anymore cats and dogs recognition, but important fields like, for instance, alpha fold to pro protein structure prediction and, and many more. So this is understood. Um, and this is also why you're seeing um, current popularity of supercomputers. Um, big tech companies are announcing their AI supercomputers. Um, and you know, supercomputing now goes far beyond the traditional uh, scientific computing when only you know big 
large governments were taking care of them. Now big companies are buying and design their specific supercomputer to, uh, to challenge a particular application. So the field is currently propelled by major industry building high specialized supercomputers. This is something that is happening. Now, um, how did we arrive to this point? So again, in the mid of 20th century, scientists tried to um, inspire the computation uh, with, in the way how our brain work. And this is probably rings a bell about perceptron model. Um, and also in 1957, we had the first formalization of perceptron thanks to the work from Frank Rosenblatt. However, if you look, the real breakthrough of machine learning came much later, right? At least 60, 70 years later. And this is the reason. And the reason is because we had now access to finally big data and computation. So these were the two key factors that managed to, to arrive to a point where uh, we can finally leverage these kind of methods. So here I just show some results from a study that I found from James Sevilla et al. And where they basically collected um, 100 milestone machine learning systems. So they really made a, quite a large study and they basically identify different uh, area. So here you see the first pre-deep learning area, which goes roughly from 1950 to around 2010, where basically uh, they identified that the, the training compute double every 17 to 29, uh, 29 months. And more or less, this is in line with Moore's law, um, which is law that you know uh, it's about the counting on transistor density, in a, in, a, in a buffer, and which is sometimes simplified as, you know, uh, increasing of computation. Um, but uh, anyway, this is, was in line with this. And then uh, what we can recognize is that uh, the, the correlation of the trend, uh, this was basically due to the popularity of, of deep learning. So, um, you know, after around 2010, uh, we could observe a slope discontinuity where the compute doubles now every between every from four to nine months. So, you know, th there is a change of, of rates. And uh, basically what happened afterwards is what we are right now, basically, which is the large scale area um, where now uh, large scale models emerge, for example, such GPT or the model I was showing before. And basically, uh, here you really need computation in order to achieve that accuracy level of accuracy that can be also used for commercial purposes. Like, um, so let's make an example just to give you some some numbers. So if we take, for example, the case of uh, GPT-3, GPT-3 is not the newest one, okay, um, but still it gives us a nice uh, uh, example where we, and here you can see, for instance. Uh, this model compared to other famous model in terms of the number of parameters. So here we are talking about 175 billion weight parameters, um, which back then was a lot. Now is still, you know, something that is not enough when compared to the newest models. But still, what we can say is that um, basically, if you look at the training time, and if we look at the training time over a single uh, NVIDIA Volta, for example, 100, this would take uh, many years, 355 years. This is the time that it would take you to do a full model training. Um, if we now, as you know, GPUs technology is moving very fast. So if you're now moving from Volta to Ampere, so the new generation, you can see that just by doing nothing, you, you will get a new technology and you get a very interesting speed up of uh, quite a lot. So in this case, it would be nine years on a video Ampere GPU. But as you know, um, we are in a phase where the free lunch is over, meaning that you know it's your responsibility as a programmer, as user, to make sure that you can the best out of many, many resources. So you are not waiting anymore that the producer will give you a more powerful CPU every every two years. It's the responsibility to to get familiar by say, okay, I now I have many many CPUs because now transistor are used to mostly to build a multi core system, HPC system. Meaning that uh, you will have to be able to, for instance, if you have a cluster, like in this case, this is a jewels cluster in Ulic. Um, it was actually uh, ranked at seven in the world in 2020, uh, first in Europe. Um, with this cluster, uh, we could 
basically uh, scaled down the training to 16 days, which is still impressive. Um, so, and I want to tell a bit more about this cluster. So this is actually a cluster that was designed in a dual usage. So it contains a large part of uh, GPUs, so it's called, we call it booster, but we have also a cluster part, which means that in the cluster part where it's mostly based on CPUs, you can run still the old fashioned, let's say simulations, like in the past was mostly done for HPC. And um, what we did here, actually we did a study and I put you the paper there, uh, we showed that actually the training on ImageNet um, for SNet 50 was completed in 43 seconds, okay, by using 1,500 GPUs. And this is, was comparable to a specialized HPC system that was bought by NVIDIA. So still, you see that um, in, uh, let's say, in, in Europe, at least, we are going in a direction where we don't, let's say, build completely monolithic specialized HPC system, but we want to still have the possibility to have different partition, in this case, one mostly based on GPU and the cluster in CPUs, because we don't want to, we want to make sure that the uh, cluster are still multi-purpose. So they can serve also not only AI, but also other applications. Um, so yeah, I think we've talked about this enough. So at the moment, GPUs, NVIDIA is the dominant player, but however, there are many other companies moving around try to, uh, to to speed up in that. Um, it is clear that GPUs is, perf is a perfect fit at the moment for what we are doing. So parallelizing basically um, matrix tensor operation and vectorization. Um, but uh, uh, with the end of uh, Denner scaling, um, I'm not entering into details, we will see that now we're actually entering even more in a phase where we're diversifying even more. So we are, you're gonna see probably in the future years, so especially also in Europe, as more specialized hardware uh, in memory computing. This is something that you should also uh, check it out. So things are changing also in this direction. Uh, so meaning that um, the, the, this diversification will grow and grow. Meaning that, uh, um, for instance, here I show you some research that we are doing at the Uli Supercomputing Center. As I said, our, let's say, uh, strategy is not to build a monolithic supercomputer, but what we call modular supercomputing architectures. Um, which are basically model system that can um, have different modules. A module is still a supercomputer, but the, the, the point here is that all these modules are, are very well interconnected into each other. That means that if you have a workflow, you will design the way how you distribute or load the computation on the different module, which could be CPUs, for instance, we could be GPUs, or could be, for instance, model computing paradigms, like for instance, quantum computing or neuromorphic computing. So uh, you see that uh, on the one hand, it will be required also a lot of effort from the programming perspective to understand how to interoperate these uh, different modules and how to distribute your workflow. Um, however, the direction that we are moving through is something that um, we want to make sure that the system that we, the new system, HPC system we will build, they will be more supportive in that direction. They will help the user to uh, identify what, which, is the, which is the best combination of modules that can serve a specific application. So you can imagine that each application has its own workflow. So you can imagine that you could design many different workflow around this, around this model of supercomputing. So, an exciting news that uh, I want to also show is that, and I'm borrowing the slide from uh, our director, Thomas Lippert in uh, the Uli Super Winning Center is that we will be selected to host the first Exascale supercomputer uh, in Europe. And uh, here is a very nice slide, which shows exactly a bit the, you know, the comparison between you know, our previous uh, supercomputer jewels that I showed you before, which is compared here by considering the diameter of the, uh, of the planet with Jupiter. And you can see here that um, what we are aiming in aiming is something very important. So we are mean we are talking about a machine that is set to surpass the threshold of one quint million. So basically one followed by 18 zeros uh, calculation per second. So this is something that will be very challenging. Uh, but the, the idea is that we want to have a system that will be able to achieve something like 20 times uh, what jewels uh, could have done in other application. 
Um, and guess what? Uh, Jupiter will be indeed a modular supercomputer super, super architecture um, because this is uh, our vision. Uh, our vision is to make sure that you know different computing technologies can cooperate together in order to achieve this so-called uh, computation in exascale. Um, and again, you can see here that the idea is that the modules should be able to uh, interact together. So release a bit of the effort on your side as a programmer. Um, so here is some statistic. Of course, this is still work in progress. The, the, the real definition of the system is not defined yet. We are in the procurement phase, uh, but we can expect a machine that uh, will be able to really to, to solve interesting application. For example, destination Earth. I think this is one has been also been this, uh, talk a lot during the HPC summit uh, a few months ago. Uh, is a set of applications within a very extreme, uh, let's say, uh, uh, challenge where we really want to find a way to make a digital twin. And uh, uh, here, modular supercomputing architecture can really, will be able to do the difference. <clears throat> okay, now uh, almost to the coffee break, but uh, let me just again, again give you a few words about uh, GRSS and what you're doing in this working group. Uh, as uh, we already told you, we are part of this Earth Science Informatics Technical Committee. And in fact, uh, this technical committee, we have here actually one of the one of the chair and Emmanuel Maskey over there. So feel free to talk to him. Uh, this, uh, he is the chair of the, uh, the Earth Science Informatics Technical Committees and then can give you all the information and details in case you're interested in, you know, join us and uh, work with us. There is a lot of work to do. <laughs> for free, <laughs> but uh, now basically we have a lot of things that we could do together. For instance, you know, this summer school is one of the this, but you know, anything that, you know, uh, we are really welcoming new ideas. Uh, in fact, one of the idea was that, you know, we proposed this working group, um, but we have also another working group here. You see databases in remote sensing, it was a very interesting topic, very relevant nowadays, especially for the multitude of data set that we have and the lack of standardization that we still have in earth observation. Um, so, you know, if you have an idea for a working group, just let us know which can fit, for instance, these topics. Um, yeah, so I think now it's clear for you, we are here. Why? Because we really want to connect uh, application for remote sensing and usage of emerging computing uh, paradigms. This is a, the real objective of this working group. And I guess this is what we want to do here in Swiss Summer School. You can join the, uh, the technical committee directly on the website. Here I also put the link, don't worry. All the slides will be available, uh, even the recording on the YouTube channel. So there is no uh, need to take screenshot now. So few idea, few just few example of activities. In fact, last year we had the summer school. It was in the other building. Um, it was very successful. In fact, you can also go to the website and you will find all the lectures online. Okay, with all the slides, the videos, everything is there. So please free uh, to, to check them out. We were a smaller group, still COVID. Uh, most of the teachers were online, but this year I'm very happy that everyone is here. Teacher, student, we can really create a nice group. And, you know, I really encourage you to use the coffee break. We have many, we have long breaks, just that you can mingle around, talk to each other, uh, and not just, you know, be passive and watching slides. I think it's not really productive eventually, but I, I think that, you know, networking is the, end, is the, the, the idea. Um, we have upcoming activities. We have a tutorial on end-to-end -end machine learning with supercomputing and in the cloud. This will be done at the IGERS 2023, so in Pasadena. And we have also organized community contributed session. Here you see three, mostly related to classical, let's say, uh, parallel and scalable computing, but also quantum computing, which is now getting more, uh, more relevant. Uh, we also, yeah, an upcoming activity. This will be 2024 in the Mediterranean and Middle East Geoscience Remote Sensing. We are invited to give a tutorial in for quantum computing for Earth observation. So about this school, I mean, you know, I think I don't want to repeat myself. Uh, this is what we are here. We want to really use all these technologies to take all application remote sensing. And uh, so the, the agenda, I suppose you are very familiar with it. It's on the website, right? So everything is clear there. But this is just to tell you that today you can see it's mostly about more like you know different speakers talking about different activities from different uh, entities. Um, so uh, and I'm very uh, happy that you know our colleagues here, uh, starting from uh, Serkan Georgin and then 
Yes, Francisco Lopez, Roberto Sarmiento, and then Heman will also talk about different aspects um, of, uh, um, you know, big data and use of uh, HPC. Um, in Iceland, for instance, we will have an overview of what's actually happening here. Um, social dinner will be from 8 to 10, okay, and this will be at this uh, restaurant. I will also provide the, the link in Slack channel, don't worry. Uh, it is a very nice venue. We had it last year. We have a very nice view on the on the arbor. It will be very nice. So please be there by uh, eight o'clock. <clears throat> so about uh, so Tuesday, Wednesday, you will be full immersed in uh, practicals, and uh, really I'm excited to have here uh, our colleague from uh, from NASA and IBM. Um, so here you really will have to uh, very interesting topic, by the way, harmonizing Landsat Sentinels. So really. Uh, understand how you can make the images taken from two different sensors, so Landsat and Sentinel, talking to each other. And this is a very interesting, uh, very interesting application. And you will see basically from from designing the workflow to the final products. And this will be done uh, hands on. Same for Wednesday. Another very interesting uh, full day. Uh, thanks a lot for coming from the science in the Netherlands. Uh, it will be very interesting also here, a lot of aspects related to the usage of HPC and workflow for developing application. So you will see these two days will be full, immerse, full immersion, while at the end, Thursday, we'll have the quantum day, we call it, where we will have uh, Ricardo Mengoni from uh, Cineca will give us a very interesting you know, overview of what's going on in Europe uh, in terms of quantum computing, what are the activities, what are the possibilities, just to create a common ground. And uh, in the afternoon, I'm also very happy to have Bertrand Lesseau from uh, the European Space Agency. will not be here. We'll give a uh, talk remotely, and he will give you a perspective from the, Earth uh, for the European Space Agency about uh, quantum ability for Earth observation. But also, I'm very happy to, work, to have here Thales Alenia Space, who are also going to talk about uh, you know, quantum computing for space. So are we ready for that? We will find out on, on Thursday. And uh, yeah, then we will close and hopefully you will be able to enjoy a bit of Iceland. Uh, so please do it, you know, just explore this beautiful country um, because you really, uh, yeah, really deserve it. Ex great acknowledgement about uh, our all uh, collaborators and sponsor, of course, first of all, GRSS from IEEE, give us, you know, really full support, but of course, all the others which are here. So very happy. And yeah, thank you very much. Um, my name is Arkan Girgin. Uh, I'm from the University of Twente, uh, Faculty of Geoinformation Science and Earth Observation, shortly known as IPC in, in, in general. Uh, so we, we are an um, education and research institution with a history of about 70 years. Uh, we are mainly focusing on in glo Global South uh, for uh, geoinformation geo and Earth, Earth, Earth observation um, and research and also a capacity development activities. Uh, I am the head of the Center of Expertise in Big Geodata Science, and I'm also an associate professor in the Geoinformation Processing Department of the faculty. So um, <clears throat> today I will talk a little bit uh, about how to lower the barrier uh, for modern cloud-based geospatial big data analysis. But um, as one of the early pr presentations, I will also take this chance to talk with you a little bit more about big data and cloud computing in general. So that's why I divided the presentation into a little bit two parts. In the first part, we will talk about big data, cloud computing, a little bit together. And then I will give you a little bit more information what can be done uh, with, uh, with innovative um, hardware and software uh, to um, to have a kind of infrastructure for, for big data processing purposes. I will not talk about HPCs at all. So for these four days, actually, you will talk a lot, and I'm sure you will learn a lot about this. But as uh, Professor um, Benedictson told at the beginning, most likely you will be HPC experts, maybe, in the future. That's what we hope. But as experts in HPCs, you should also know what are the other options that are available, right? So that's why I think, uh, and I hope this presentation and talk will be a kind of introduction for that purpose, and maybe also a little bit icebreaker uh, among us. So um, um, 
big data, I mean, there are many definitions of, of big, big, big data. So uh, Donna was also showing in, uh, in her presentation this uh, famous V's, so the volume, velocity, variety, etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, these are the three well-knowns. But at one point, actually, as very innovative researchers and um, uh, academics, we managed to come up to almost 30 different V words to define big data only in English language. So it shows from one point of view how rich English is, but at the same time, how creative we are to, to find some, some, some fancy words to define the things. But in, in its essence, actually, big data is large and complex data that is difficult to process. So these three words are a little bit interesting because uh, being large, complex, and difficult are quite relative things, right? So I don't think we have anybody who, who, who use these punch cards to, to enter data, um, <laughs> because probably that was um, before our era. Uh, but at the time, actually, this, this large, large uh, stack of uh, punch cards it was the big data at, at its time. So at one punch card was able to keep about 80 bytes of data. So all this bunch, if it includes 100,000 cards, uh, amounts about less than eight megabyte of data. So which is in fact smaller than the size of this picture in its original format, right? So probably are more familiar with this more modern technologies like the CD-ROMs and that kind of thing. So at that time, in fact, a set of uh, CD-ROM in, in, in a bag was, was big data. And it was also not only the, the, the the, 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 the medium uh, or, or the amount of the data, but it was also the problem of the transfer of the data at that time. Uh, so this is a picture that I took quite recently because our faculty moved from one building to another building. And during that period, they allowed us to take only two boxes per person. So people started to throw the old things. Um, and this was a box um, thrown by a colleague uh, coming from 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 USJs in in the states, uh, because at that time the only way to to transfer this large amount of data was a, a air parcel, so the internet connection was not sufficient for that purpose. And if I counted correctly, there are around yeah. So if I come to correctly, there are about 26 CD-ROMs there. And 26 CD-ROMs nowadays uh, means less than 16 gigabytes of, of, of storage, which is smaller than this US stick which you can buy for five years. Right? So it's very easy. So uh, by using an online calculator, actually, you can you can very rapidly calculate if it normally takes only two minutes to transfer nowadays with a one gigabit connection. So what is interesting is actually not this, this time, but this scale. So the, the, the data scale there is almost at the minimum. So nobody talks about 16 gigabytes of data anymore, right? But at the same time, the transfer rate is maximum. So how many of you uh, have one gigabit connection at workplace? Right, so almost half. So this is the maximum normal that you get, and we have it. And we have it even at home, almost one gigabit connection. So the connection, even if it's, it's the maximum, it is very easy to accessible. And that's the thing that is changing nowadays. Now, it's not the relatively big data, but it, in fact, it's a relatively easy access to process, to access this big data. So uh, data being big and um, difficult to access is only one part of, 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 of this. The other third word about the complex, right? Data being complex. And something being complex is also quite relevant. So for me, actually, this little bit is basically quite complex and difficult thing to solve. Unfortunately, I got very lazy to learn all these techniques. So it really takes a lot of time for me to do so, whereas if you know how to solve it, I mean, you can solve it very quickly in less than three seconds. So, right? so um, it's very clear. Some people are really uh, have, have capabilities to do it, but it is also about 
to, how to know how to do it. Know the techniques and study techniques so that you get better and better. So I don't think I can be able to solve it in three minutes, but maybe I, if I study, I can I can solve it in time. You know, I continue to study, I can reduce the time to three minutes, but definitely not in three minutes. So that's why learning is very important, especially in the big data domain. So and by attending this summer course, which we we will be able to add more skills and tool sets to your budget to deal with this complex and large data sets. But let's find out what is big for us, right? So we are here all together. So there is a multimeter survey. I can't ask only the, the students to uh, to to apply this. So the question is, what is big for us? So again, some options uh, for data size. Hmm. It's nice to see that everybody is on the on the on the higher side of this. So I will be honest with you. I had the same survey last week with another group of people, and it was the, the opposite. So, <laughs> <laughs> and it was also about the big data uh, workshop. So um, it's also the relativity of big data, depending on the disciplines that you are in. In fact, the data science may change significantly. But here, because we are specializing in new science, I think this is, this is reflected here. So most of the people, in fact, process large amount of data. So the second question is what are the file formats of large data that you, you process frequently? So you can indicate activities, CSVs. Looks like it is living in it. more specifically. Or how many people are using uh, cloud optimized versions of this? Okay, not me. Maybe, maybe we, we will learn how to use them <laughs> during this, this mm -hmm. summer school. What is interesting is not to see uh, recent data formats. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, GeoTIF was quite recent up to a few years ago, but in fact now we have much more uh, optimized formats uh, for, 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 for big data, and it looks like they're not very much uh, common common news. But maybe during this this school you will learn more about that. Okay, thank you. Let's continue. <clears throat> the second part. So another another men's meeting. About what is the next and difficult for us? Okay, the first question is well, what are the complex data you need to process? So let's see what we have. We have high dimensional data, data cubes, and time series. Large data sets in a short amount of time. So it's velocity part of the big data is there. Okay. The complex value raw star data. Who is processing the data? Okay, we have one star. More than one sub 
It's great. Hyper spectral data, multiple bias time series. How many people are processing long time series? Okay, hundreds of almost almost everyone. So probably tomorrow's part about Landsat Sentinel will be also quite relevant for you. Okay. Next question. What are the challenges that you have by this? So you see that you are processing in fact quite different large variants of, 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 of data, right? <clears throat> so what are the most typical things that you encounter? Time. Making resources and time, computation to be powered. Storage, loading to memory, disk space, optimization and processing time. Quality. Quality, you mean who says quality? Yeah, can you can you explain? Me? Okay, good data quality. Okay, seconds. It looks like we have these three common problems. The first one is the computation time. Second time problem is the storage. And the third one is the optimization. So, and all these three factors are in fact part relevant for HPC clusters, but for cloud computation in general, because these technologies are in fact targeting to small. <clears throat> So uh, solutions in fact exist for all these challenges, right? So if we are dealing with medium-sized data and from medium-sized data for this audience, I mean several terabytes of, 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 of data, then in fact using parallel computing techniques may solve the issues. So uh, as Gabriele mentioned, the medium technology we have more and more cores that are available in the city. And if we can use all these cores, and you can speed up the computation significantly. Then the question becomes can you really efficiently be able to use? If you need to do machine learning and AI, so right now, the, the only feasible option is to do the GPUs. And in time, we will have TPUs and other technologies that are already in place but becoming more and more dominant. It's, that means we need to have access to special hardware and special infrastructure. And if you need to process real big data, if you want to do global data processing for sometimes continental or even national, but for long time series, then you need to have access to a distributed computing environment. And APC is one of them. But another thing that you can have a look is cloud computing. So cloud computing, in fact, provides you the infrastructure that is necessary to solve this issue. So you have access to specialized hardware and at the same time you have access to a large amount of computing resources and storage. In essence, cloud computing is the on-demand availability of, of the resources for data storage and for computing purposes without direct active management by users. And this is the critical part. So with cloud computing, you can access on-demand resources as a self-service. So you don't need to interact with any, anybody. So you just go, go, go to the portal, you select what you want, and then you, you get it. So basically, you can do all the tasks by yourself. You can access all those resources through the entire connection. You can access from your tablet, you can access from your mobile phone, you can access from, from your workstation, and you can do your, your computing through all these interfaces, all the apps and metaphors that are available. Resource pooling allows you to access a large amount of resources. So basically, the service providers, they have enormous number of CPUs, systems that are available. So whenever you ask for resources, you get it. 
you don't need to wait in the queue. You don't need to wait a few hours, a few days to be able to access the resources. Okay. Moreover, the rapid elasticity gives you the option to scale up and down. So while prototyping your workflow, you can use only one machine. Once your workflow is finished, you can easily scale up to 10, up to 100, and to 1,000 future machines if you want to, and if you have resources for your purpose. So it is very easy to go up and down, and everything is made. So it's possible to monitor what's going on, and you always know how many and how much resources you utilize, what is the cost associated with. So these are the critical distinct features of platform, which sounds quite natural and normal now, but 10 years ago, most of these features were not available. So we get the data centers, but the data centers were accessible only by selected people. But right now, if you have it's only a credit card, you can access all those resources and you can look into papers. You can hear the demo, demo accounts. They give you very easily 500 euros or 1,000 euros for, for credits, which you can use to learn these technologies. Why it is important to know these technologies? Well, actually, the reason is everything is moving to the top. That's, that's the answer. So all the mobile applications that we use right now are in fact working on cloud. GPT is, 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 is a cloud technology. In fact, we are just using the interfaces, right? And geocomputing is not different. So geocomputing is also moving to the cloud. And this is where the big changes is in fact happening. So all these data centers that were with limited access in the past are now becoming really easy accessible. And the reason is because now we get open source software systems, which people can deploy uh, on common with the hardware to create these complete clusters. Even you can do it if you read the documentation, it is relatively easy to do. It. The private companies are there, so we have cloud service providers which are very easy to access and relatively heavy low cost. But at the same time, our research ICT infrastructure and research clouds are also getting the advantage. So most probably in your countries, by writing a two-page proposal, you are able to access HPC classes for free. That's the case in most, at least most of European countries. So, uh, but I'm sure it's, that's the global difficulties. So they are really easy, easy to access and for you. So but what is required to be able to do that? You need to change the way of your learning. So you need to change your models of IAM because using cloud resources is not like using your laptop. Open the desktop application and do the computation. So you really need to be able uh, to set up your environment start moving the resources, start managing the resources, and once your computation is done, stop using it. So this is, this is something you should learn, and this is why you need to change your, 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 your type of work. There are challenges for that work. So it's, it sounds relatively easy to do, but unfortunately it is not, not the case. So the statistical is it's not like that. So, Identifying the cases like cloud computing, big data techniques can play a role, is still a challenge for you. So, some of you are probably PhD students, some of you are about to start a PhD. So, do you have a clear understanding if cloud computing, big data, HPC technologies can help with your thesis? Or is it just a tool which may speed up your computation? Gabriela told that nothing is for free, right? So you need to spend time to be able to use this technology. So is it really And which solutions should you choose? So these are the challenges that we have. Um, and let's see what are your needs for that purpose. <clears throat>
we have some options here. So learning more on example use cases because seeing what other people are doing with these two lines of technologies may give you some ideas, right? So maybe it can be useful. If informed about new tools and technologies, the landscape is quite complex and in each, almost each week, we have a new version of a new a, a technology or a complete new technology. So the in front is also difficult. Access to complete infrastructure is sometimes a challenge. Training on tools and technologies. I think this is why you are here, right? So, um, but at the same time, being able to get technical support is something very important. So, um, with the systems, um, requires an interdisciplinary approach, a team science. So as a researcher, you are responsible for developing your scientific workflow, but you need technical people to support you in optimize it, in make it more compatible with the infrastructure that is provided, or to make it more optimized so that it works better. So it really requires technical support, which may come also from the community. So that's also something that's changing. So when we talk about science, you know, we talk about open science, right? So uh, sharing what we learn with others. And community support is really something that's becoming more and more important. So it looks like they are all equally important for us, <laughs> which, is, which is from one point of view good, but at the, at the other point of view, it also shows that there is a lot of things that we need to do. So I will have some quick suggestions for you. Three of them. The first one is to inspect what, what's going on. So um, at our center, we are supporting our colleagues, the researchers, PhDs, staff members, and 95% of the time they come with a problem which they tell they cannot process the information that they say or it takes too much time, or it requires too much storage, like your case. The first question we ask, do you monitor? Do you monitor what's going on? And in 90% 90, 90 of the cases, unfortunately, they don't know. They don't, they don't monitor. This is very important. Just open your task manager and see why you are with complete complication. If only one call is, is running, or all the first three effects, makes a difference. Because if you see there is only one core that is running, it means as much as you scale it up, it won't change because you will be able to use only one core even if you have thousands of cores that are running. It. it means you are using wrong tool for that purpose. You need to change your software, right? But if you see more cores that are innovation, in that case, maybe you should start thinking about, okay, maybe the okay, computing cluster may have, maybe it's just a two-way HPC system, maybe they have a small cluster, right? So that's why, it is the first thing that you should do, follow what's going on. Even without efficient use of existing resources, is suboptimal and costly. The second suggestion, read the documentation. So, we have all these nice open source systems that are available, right? The good thing is not because they are open available, but in fact, nowadays, the tools that we have are also very nicely documented. And there's a reason behind it. It's not only to have a larger user community, but to, to have an informed user community. Because these tools, especially the, the ones that are targeted on HPC clusters, requires good knowledge about how the computing is taking place. Unless you know that how it is taking place, you cannot use it efficiently, you cannot optimize it, it's impossible. That's why it is very important to read. So scaling blindly, so finding a script, updating the parameters and running it on the HPC cluster is blind scaling up. And it's sub opening and it's costly for everyone. So that's why it's very important to, to, to spend some time and effort in reading the documentation to understand how things are taking place. The third one, use the right services. <coughs> so when we talk about platform in general, 
there are many S's around. Infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. Mm -hmm. Even nowadays, they are talking about functions. I'm not even counting data as a service, data processing as a service. So these are all different levels of services that are available. So depending on, on, on your needs, choosing the correct service may make a difference. There are also many platform providers if you look at the platform. So we have Amazon, we have Google, we have um, Azure, Microsoft. How many of you did use uh, Amazon Web Services? Okay, Google, Azure. Which one is the best according to you? Anybody who says it's Amazon. It's difficult to say which one is best, right? Why it is difficult to say which one is best? Uh, we, first of all, we are not expert in it. And secondly, we don't have experience using all of them to be able to compare. So for example, I myself, I only use Google, so I cannot compare. Mm -hmm. Why do you use Google? Uh, because Google for Engine is the most well known for geospatial data processing in my field. So I have a little bit of experience in that, and I heard from my colleagues that they are working on that. So I got excited about it and I used it. But since it wasn't very useful for my case, the data that I'm using, so I didn't use it. Okay, you didn't continue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it wasn't very useful okay. for my case. <laughs> okay, that's, that's nice. Someone who used Amazon. So, uh, Tanta, why, why you use Amazon? Why I use Amazon? Yeah. Um, they told me that I worked for the AWS consulting partner, but I also used Azure okay. before. And I think it's hard to say which one is the best because I feel like they all have different advantages and drawbacks. So, not AWS because there's kind of a premium option. That's what Obviously, it's also the most costly, and then I don't think really like Azure because it's not a big company, still so really into this called Microsoft like ecosystem, I want to say, and then it breaks really smoothly. So, I think it really depends on your use case, which yeah. one's the best. Okay, yeah, if you are part of the ecosystem, then the selection is easy, right? You right. just continue it's the same by using a, a, a platform, for example. So, um. But in, in, in general, overall, we, all these cloud service providers, are, they are so high level in, 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 in the service that they provide. All the common features are quite similar to you. So if you have virtual machines from Amazon, they won't be significantly different from what you get from Azure or, or Google. And it's the same with cloud storage or sometimes also with open services. What makes a difference is some specialized the services that they provide. In this case, for reading something and geospatial analysis. For example, if you choose Azure, then it's possible to have access to machines that are specifically designed for GeoAI using even um, uh, our, our GIS, which is not an open source system, right? If you go with Google, it is possible to use uh, GPUs which significantly uh, reduce the comp computation time. So in this example, something that's taking place in took more than 200 minutes it's finishing in, in, in eight minutes. So this is the example actually quite similar to what Gabriele is showing. So if you, if you have access to these technologies, then you can try and you can, you can significantly reduce your computing time. Google Earth Engine, how many people are using Google Earth Engine? Okay. Now you very know, well known, it's a game changer. Right. So, um, what makes Google Earth Engine special? The easy of access to the data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Access to data. Yeah. That's it. So, I mean, and first in our origin. Yeah. For me, it was like like you can scale from mm -hmm. one sentiment to dial to multiple. Yes. Our motorcycle that's changing the patient return. Okay. Anybody else? And also that it's connected to visualization tools, so you can directly see what you uh, did. 
and it's free. And it's free. <laughs> yes. Or it was free, I don't know. Yeah, it's, from, from outside, if you look, it, it has a nice collection of uh, all the best. So it has a large amount of data sets that are available. It has a nice developing environment that is available. It has the visualization that is integrated with that. And there is also a community around it because all the posts are, most of the posts are publicly available. So if you want to do analysis, it's quite likely that you can find an example. Even there are giving some examples, right? So uh, that's why it is a game changer. Um, but there is one disadvantage of poor engine. What would be the best? Flexibility? Flexibility? Is, yeah, it's one of them. That's true. It's not only one. So there are several. One of them is flexibility. Yes. Exporting. Sorry? Exporting. Exporting is an issue. Yeah. Unless you pay, if you pay, it's possible. What else? You're limited by the data. Limited? By the data. Okay. Now, these are all operational limitations, but if you look also, uh, for example, open science point of view. So, the system is completely closed, right? So, we don't know what this is, what's happening. And that becomes also a reproducibility problem. So, if you have something that is not on Google Engine, there is no guarantee that it will be reproducible in, in, in the future. So, of course, as researchers, we mostly focus on doing our job, but at the same time, there are new trends in doing our job, right? So, which maybe we should take into consideration. So, that's why there are new initiatives. So, Open EO is one of them, and they are, they are, they are trying to provide something like Google Earth Engine, that is as a, as a software platform, um, with all the capabilities that are needed. So, please have a look, and I think you may find some nice use cases. So, and they will also connections with the with, with, with the HPC systems in, in, in the world. Local cloud can also be a, a nice option uh, to, to consider. And it's partly what we have at our community. So uh, the very geospatial company platform, which provides a uh, deeply enabled uh, purpose units, but at the same time, big data from the units, the record memories, so 800 gigabytes of memory has significant number of posts and GPUs. It's ready to use in fact in notebooks, um, which serves more than 500 uh, users uh, right now in a very reasonable cost, which is less than monthly, uh, less than 100 euros. So, actually, this is the part where I want to talk to you about some innovation. So, um, the reason behind this geospatial computing platform, so basically about two years ago when I joined the faculty, the idea was to establish the center mm -hmm. and also to provide the kind of computing in infrastructure to, to, to the researchers. The first thing that I did was to talk with many people to understand their needs. And what I found out is that like, the needs were not limited to big data, but the geospatial computing in general. So people were in need to have a kind of access to a platform which they can use. That's why we designed this platform for three main reasons, self-learning, exploratory research, and education activities, with some, uh, some criteria in mind. So the first one was high availability. So trying to foster availability, accessing to computing resources without waiting. Ready to use computing environment, which means all the software is installed. It's, you don't need to do anything. You just go in and start using the system immediately. To be interactive, uh, user friendly interfaces. GPUs, because they are becoming more and more important and they are a little bit difficult to, uh, to access, uh, trying to give uh, one GPU to each user. So whenever they don't need to sustain the they get to be to access the GPUs. But at the same time, they provide this to be of the capability so that they can, they can, they can try this kind of techniques at the relatively low cost. And um, this is the solution that we found. It might be quite interesting because uh, eventually, I think you will be, probably you will be a user of, of, of this kind of technologies, the HPC is the big data platform thing. But at one time in your career, you may be also in a position to provide this kind of systems, platforms, capabilities to others. 
So that's why knowing the other side of, of the coin is also, also important. So how you can build your own computing infrastructure if necessary. So um, here are solutions uh, to, to provide a GPU to, 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 to each user to us to use in fact edge AI units. So these edge AI units are very small and something to keep uh, computing is provided by the media. They are normally uh, designed for robotics applications. So basically, probably you know this uh, famous famous robots Google is developing which jump and uh, do all the acrobatics, right? So this kind of uh, equipment is, is in fact in, 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 in those units. We took them and we converted them into competing competing units because they each has a GPU that is strong enough to do the computation. And we created a, a Jupyter app, which means a Jupyter. How many of you are using Jupyter to get to know it? So, um, as you know, Jupyter lab notebooks are, are accessible as notebooks, but it's possible to also provide these notebooks to mark your people. And that's what the Jupyter Hub is doing. And for that purpose, we use a, a Docker a container environment. So, how many of you are familiar with containers? I have a, a very okay. I have a very interesting uh, pattern from my side. So it looks like this side of the room <laughs> is technical. So <laughs> whenever I ask a technical, and that part is a bit more application oriented, which is good. So that means we have really a, a nice heterogeneous mix with, with user community. I highly suggest you also for this part of the room. Uh, to have a look at the container technologies because the containers are becoming uh, really almost uh, the, the, the horses, the motors of um, computing, especially the ones that you want to be able to isolate and uh, distribute easily. Uh, so uh, they are very easy to use and it allows you to also create reproducible work workflows which you can share with, with others. So um, they are very useful. In our case, we use those technologies to, to create our computing environment. Um, we started really quite small. So the initial uh, initial version of the computing environment was in fact based on only four units that we had the external hard drives that are connected. So it's very basic and partly I think something like this for 500 uh, people faculty is partly seems to be an interesting start. But actually, it is important uh, to have a start and then have an expansion policy in mind. So um, first, blindly buying everything that you can to create the state of our best technology complete environment doesn't make a complete environment useful. Most of the time, you stay idle and you start fishing for use cases. So that's why it's important to start small, but grow only depending on the meaning of demand. The upgrade first instead of buying something new. We purpose either resources. So all of us are researchers, right? So we are usually working on two, three year projects, and normally we, we, we have some equipment for the project. And what happens when the project finishes? Next project. <laughs> what about the, the hardware that we have for the move to the next project? If it's mine, yeah, sure, but okay. usually it's not. Usually it's not. That's actually quite the case. So most of the time those resources are not much used. But in fact, they are quite 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 useful. We can really maintain and uh, upgrade those systems. So eventually, by having the expansion of this, like this, it's possible to, to come up with uh, a much more powerful system at the end. Right now, our platform has um, more, more than 25 computing resources, including these edge units, but at the same time, we need proper and media uh, powerful GPU and based on the entire architecture and proper, proper service. And this heterogeneous system works quite nicely. For a complete uh, full stack of big data computing, starting from low-level libraries, 
up to the high framework side due to this juice part, spatial value desired part will be from our paper, but at the same time, does there us an answer for? The system is accessible to a browser, no observation is necessary, as I mentioned. Every day is isolated for the environment. But the critical thing from our point of view, when we connect to a system, we have all the resources that are available on the system. If the system has 800 gigabytes of memory, we have 800 gigabytes of memory. If it has 20 terabytes of storage, we have 20 terabytes of storage. Useful for you. But at the same time, we create also a computing cluster, which you can access. It means all the resources are also available in cluster formation. Uh, interactive mode of time on Android is the as the parts access are available in many different interactive languages, but at the same time, we are providing an update and ready to use working environment, including all well known uh, geospatial and unit sensing packages. Um, public data sets are part of the platform, so if you need to process all these different data, you don't need to download it because it's already there, so you, 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 can, you can use it directly, but you can also create shared workspaces. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, um, the environment is ready to use. We have in total more than 1,500 packages in Python and all major uh, machine learning and geospatial packages are available ready to use. Moreover, most of desktop applications that are required for your tasks are also ready to use. So QJS plus other specific things, but moreover, we have a MATLAB, GNU Octa, and R Studio for development. Um, so these are all available to in desktop applications. And the benefit is instead of using your own laptop with limited resources, you can use all the resources that are available on the hard platform. One thing we easily forget is the existing technologies. So how many of you are using Postgres Cloud, Postgres database? Okay, now we have less hands, which is which is good, but at the same time, this is what we are also talking about. Because your special databases, they are still there, and they are still different developing their own world. But unfortunately, this big data cloud computing I have this part of forgetting all these technologies, which can be very useful for many purposes. So if you create your data sets, maps, how can you share them? What's the typical for you? If you if you have a data set, how do you share it? The drive. You don't share it. Probably Google Drive, right? <laughs> <laughs> So data sharing is the point of inter um, interoperability is the, uh, the, the, the core uh, of collaborative science actually. So basically, unless you make the data set that you develop easily available for others, they they cannot be used. That means you you will not be recognized for what you do, and the things that you develop will only stay and probably die. In, in short term. So that's why it's very important to be able to use technologies like GeoServer, NetServer, which helps you to share your data in an interoperable way so that people can easily access it. Or you can use contact management systems that are based on those data technology like, like Geomo. So we, um, we have all sharing systems like GitHub, GitLab, open data to for field collection. So these are all that world technologies which can support your data. And we should not forget, actually. But sorry to interrupt. Don't you think, if you also come back to the previous slide, that one of the main issue, main issue is that actually we have so many, too many. Too many, yeah. Like if you come back, like, yeah. do we really need all of this? That's the question, right? So is, should the work more focus on make everything available, like on the cloud system, or trying to, you know, shrink. shrinking a bit and, you know. OK, that's a good question. So what do you think about this? I like the green. <laughs> you like the green? Okay. Anybody else? Yes? I think different platforms come with different, uh, like they have their own plus points. 
you know, for example, in our state, we can do interferometry, but it's commercial. So it would be nice and ideal to have some like one package or one place where you have everything, but at the same time, it's, it's a lot of community for that situation. Yes. Okay. That's a good point. Any other? Uh, yes. So ideally, of course, if if the tool the issuing every single tool is 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 optimal, then that's the best choice that we can make, the best solution. But unfortunately, the, the current landscape is hard to grow this. So you still need grass changes to do certain kind of computation if you want to do it best or if you want to have some 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 options <coughs> for you. So QGIS is not the solution for all GIS applications, for example. Even antenna is really significantly far ahead uh, from providing the optimum uh, optimum working program. It's quite unlikely if your data is more than five gigabytes in time processing. How many people try to, to process large amount of data in QGIS? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why actually, um, unfortunately, we are in a, well, first of all, we are in a lucky position because we have all those options. So it was not like that in the past. Now we have all those, those options, but as Gabriel and Ashin, partly it is difficult to know which one to choose because it requires significant time and effort to, to check everything, right? So it's like, a, unfortunately, programming question. So sometimes on, maybe if you follow the state exchange, etc., people ask, okay, What's the what's the best way to, to do to this computation? And the typical answer that you get, you should benchmark. So you should write the code. You should write it twice. So the technique that you want to, to write and the standard one to see which one is faster. Unfortunately, we don't have this luxury, and that's partly the reason why people stick to some solutions, even if it takes a little time to complete. That's why actually sharing experience is very important. And the training activities like this summer school is also very really important. Actually, I think we are very lucky. In these four days, you will see this very wide range of technologies from the experts, which can tell you all these tips and tricks, which hopefully the so my answer to the question, I think we are not there. So shrinking. For the time being, no, but maybe it's coming. Yeah, that's that's coming. So user support is something very important, which you need to provide. It is really something. So just providing the infrastructure, it does not have people. And uh, they, they try it and then they stop using it. So if you want people to use, it's also the same with your software. So if you do a software, it's, if you do a data set, it's part of your thesis, which you want people to use, you should support people for that purpose. You should, you should try to create a community, you should be uh, proactive in answering their questions and responding to their needs. Oh, I was speaking on part of it, you are not very clear. So eventually, <coughs> eventually, with this kind of, with this, with this approach, it might be possible to change the culture. So when we started to provide our computing environment, there was no Central infrastructure available at our facility. There was no central infrastructure available at the university. And after they tried our system, the central ICT program, oh, this looks very nice. So, can you help us to have something similar? So, and uh, through our help, now our university has a central computing platform that's available for everyone. And so, it's some small steps to make it also open because this is what we did. So right now we have more than 500 registered users, but at one time it was more than 800. And the change was due to the other faculties who are using our platform for their computers. So we were serving almost double the number of people just to be able to change the culture. And now, because the option is available, it's not our task anymore. So we finished our mission. That's why we, we are now saying we are sorry we cannot use it. 
Such systems can be used for education purposes, especially for courses, because the courses are meant for people who provide the academic education in Okay, so only is the challenge to provide a competent environment for the students. So how many of you are using a different competing environment each time for a different course? That is this month. It's it is good. But it's very typical for IPC, I can tell you. So if, if you are following the water resources course, okay, people ask you to use one software, one environment. If you follow a geoinformation processing course, they ask you to use another one. One instructor asks you to learn Python, the other one asks you to, to learn R. And if you are unlucky, somebody else will ask you to learn Meta. So that happens quite quickly, right? So uh, but with this kind of system, it is possible because you can also have the self-learning option. Really good. So listen, I want to share you with some, some lessons learned. So mixed computing environments may work. So uh, putting a, a server grade, a data sample and quality server together with a uh, HAI unit it seems quite a challenging start at the beginning, but it is good. So it takes some time, but we can do it. We can also involve more people. We can uh, uh, collaborate with your report. We can donate some equipment, even at the personal level, which you can share with others. And using second hand equipment sometimes can really help if your budget is limited. Rolling updates means you update everything all the time. So um, the idea to provide the computing a platform or the idea to, to follow the, the technology as you are trying to do right now should be to, to, to try to follow all the recent developments, not to stick a technology which was developed two or three years ago. That's already the outdated version. That's why it's really important to follow the, the, the latest version of this all the software so that you can get all these capabilities and optimizations. And doing it that computing platform is very difficult because then you push all these 500 people with you. So you take the responsibility of accepting emails. If you change something, my code is not working anymore. Yes, we did. We did. Uh, and you should also, because if you still, still use Python 3.6, I'm sure you are doing something wrong. This shouldn't be your, your state of the art research. Community building, as I mentioned, is very important, and you should be also open to messages like this. So stop sending the emails, stop sending the emails. So this is a, a real feedback that I get. So this was a bit, this is the short version. I think he, he copy pasted it 100 times. And now, I was not sending so frequent emails to be honest. So, but people can read it piece of pretty quickly, but you should, you should be open to this kind of things. And the most difficult one is the user stories. So basically, the best way to convince people is to show the example. And the best examples come from people that they know. So your, your friend, he or she shows you something, you are more open to this. If your colleague shows you a new technology, you need to, you are more open to this, right? But these are extremely difficult to convince. So this rich English, in fact, as a as a as a as a word for this, so to be without saying goodbye. So this happens very very frequently, you know. So you you provide a platform to, to the people, they do their master's thesis, they do their PhD studies, and without saying anything, they just leave. Please do don't do that. <laughs> um, we don't need to say thank you. This is not also what we are waiting, but please inform what you did so that they can, they can share also. So if, if, if you share what you do, then they, if the platform operators, they, they can share with hundreds of people. They can put it in their newsletter. They, they can really help you to get also some visibility. And then you can also help them to collect these stories so that they can, they can, they can, they can convince people. So please do that. And finally, a few small suggestions for, for the newcomers. So please ensure your community with platform 
in short talks and lectures. You are in a very good place for this purpose. Let's go to you. If you know how by participating in two-man technology specific training. So uh, post-COVID era, we are really lucky. So these trainings are everywhere. They are everywhere and they are also online everywhere. So you can really register, you can follow two specific tools and technologies. Please try to use that. So don't be afraid to give your credit card because Amazon is asking for your credit card or Azul is asking for your credit card. Everywhere they're asking for that information. We are sharing it. Huh? So, and just giving it will open you an opportunity to test all these technologies. Maybe to do this, some of school, you will have access to CERT, you will have access to, uh, to the German HPC cluster, right? And maybe also here, I don't know. So, to be seen. So, but these are all good, good opportunities that you should follow. Try to follow a hybrid approach. So, mix the cloud with local resources that you have. It might be also a good solution for you. Don't be afraid to ask for technical support. So those people are there to help you. I also include myself as part of the part of research and part of the research support. So we are we are here for you to help your questions. Right? And but ask also for guidance. So don't only ask starting something and something something on the Maybe you can contact those people before starting. So you can explain your idea and they can help you. To come up with a workflow with an infrastructure with a, with a setting that may be better. Um, and share your know how your knowledge. That's also very, very important. For the ones who are interested, there are some best practices in moving your research cloud. So I will just skip this, but this is a part of the presentation. There is also a, a scientific publication about it. I highly recommend you to have a look. If you are interested in moving your research product. And please feel free to contact me or our center in the group if you have any questions. We have a Twitter account and we have also a digital data newsletter. And if you subscribe, you will receive the monthly newsletters which will provide information about these products. Okay, so good afternoon. Um, well, first of all, thanks a lot to the organization, to Gabriel, Gabriele and, and to Dora for the, for the invitation. It's my fourth time here in Iceland. So I'm very happy to be here back again. Probably, hopefully it will not be the last one uh, because I love the, the landscape, also the weather, <laughs> and, uh, but mostly the people, the nice people here in, in Iceland. So yeah, what I'm going to talk about uh, together with my colleague Roberto is, is about um, a technology with which uh, we have been working for the last, let's say 14 years more or less, for 13 years more or less. So it's hyperspectral technology and some of the projects in, in which we, we are working. And um, for that, uh, what we have done is we have divided uh, the presentation in, in, in three parts. I will present the first one, part one. It will take more or less 25 minutes. Then Roberto, we will talk. Uh, he will talk uh, for the part two about uh, some uh, projects and architectures he uses on board satellites, together with some projects with the European Space Agency and also with the European Union. And finally, I will come back to finish with some of the projects, some additional projects in which we are working, mainly related to agriculture, environmental science, or or health. All of them making use of this hyperspectral technology. So first of all, let me, let me introduce uh, where do we come from, uh, which is from the, from the Canary Islands in the Northwest coast of Africa, but, but it's a region which, a Spanish region. So it's a, a very nice region, which is uh, some more or less more than, than 4,000 kilometers away from, from Iceland. It takes something like five hours to reach Iceland from, from the Canary Islands in a direct flight. It's very comfortable flight. You can have a couple of um, uh, films during the during the, the trip or half a sleep for one hour, and that's all. And in five hours, you 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 are in, in Iceland. Um, 
Yeah, Canary Islands, as you can see here, is, is an excellent place for, for staying. Um, you can enjoy a lot uh, in the beaches we have there, and mainly because of the temperatures we have all over the all over the year. A population of 2.2 million inhabitants, uh, from which 13% is more or less uh, foreigners, and then we receive around 13 million tourists in all over the, the, the Canary Islands. But apart from, from, from being an excellent holiday place, it's also an excellent place for working hard, as we normally do. Um, and if we compare this with, with, with Iceland, um, we see that in Iceland, we have a much less population, but the percentage of foreigners are, are much larger, higher. And then in terms of tourists, it's more or less half of the tourists that, that we receive in the Canary Islands. So both of them are Iceland, although Iceland is a much bigger Iceland. Um, but yeah, they, they, they have some similarities. So in the Canary Islands, we have two universities, two public universities, apart from three private ones. And uh, from the two public universities, uh, we work at the University of Las Palmas de Gran Canaria with more or less 20,000 uh, students. And within this university, there are 11 research institutes. One of them is the Institute for Applied Macroelectronics, which is where we mainly do our research. And within the, the UMA, the, the Research Institute for Applied Macroelectronics, we have seven different uh, divisions. And we belong to the Integrated System Design Division. And in fact, Roberto is the coordinator of, of this uh, division. We have been working for a long time, uh, something like 33 years ago, we started working together, but uh, he, he coordinates the, the division. These are some of the companies with which uh, we have some relationships. Some of them are Spanish, some others are European. For example, we have Spanish GNV, uh, Indra, Singular Aircraft, but then we have Thales Alenia Space, iBoost, Telespacio, and, and so on uh, from, from other countries, mainly in France and, and Germany. And this is just a photo of some of the people that, that work there. Um, in fact, uh, I have to mention that probably I, I am the third oldest in the team. So imagine how young are the rest of the team because I'm, I'm, I'm one of the oldest one right now. <laughs> okay, so let, let's start by telling when we decided to, to work on hyperspectral technology, which was the motivation to work on that? It was in something like in, in, in year 2010, more or less. And there were mainly three reasons for working on hyperspectral. The first one was that by that, by that, by that time, and, and also now, we saw that there was a big market uh, for this technology. And in fact, as you can see, it continues having a rising market for, for hyperspectral technology. And that means money. That means projects, that means companies, industries, and that motivated us to work on this because as, as university research teams, we mainly are looking for budget in order to contract students and to do new projects and so on, PhD thesis and, and so on. So that was uh, one reason. Um, in fact, uh, the, the largest market in hyperspectral technology is, is in the United States, but then there are some countries, uh, mainly in the East countries, that are growing a lot uh, by using this, this technology and applications of these technologies. So this is very motivating for, for working on this. The second reason was as, as research teams, as researchers at the university, we are looking for, for publishing papers in conferences and, and in journals. Um, but at the time we saw that there was an increase in the number of papers in journals related to hyperspectral technology. So that was also motivating, but not only that, but uh, there, was, there was also synergy with other uh, technologies, such as satellites, airplanes, and since year 2011, also with, with UAVs and manned uh, aerial vehicles or drones, which was also a part of research in our team. So we can mix both technologies, UAVs together with hyperspectral technology in order to make better applications and projects and so on. And the third reason for, for, for working on this technology was because of the applications. So there are applications that come for agriculture, ocean uh, environment, um, health, um, space applications, 
uh, mining and things like that, that was very attractive for us because of the huge amount of different projects in which we could work. So this, this were some of the main reasons by which we decided to start working on this uh, something like 13 years ago. Now let's see how, how does this technology works. And in order to do that, let's just start with, with, with the most complex sensor that we can find in, in nature, as it is the, the eye, the human eye. And in the human eye, uh, there are different steps uh, till we create an image in our brain. The first step is when light rays uh, enter to the eye through the cornea. And after some different parts within the eye, they finish in the in the retina, which somehow resembles to a, an analog analog film in in a in a old, ca old camera or photography. So it's where all the images is, is grab it. So that should be the retina, and in the retina we find um, photoreceptors. That in, in fact there are two different type of, of photoreceptors, which are the rod and, and cones, and these photoreceptors photoreceptors has different uh, characteristics. One of them is that the rods are much more in number than the cones. Rods are approximately 100 million of photoreceptors, while cones are approximately 7 million. And the second difference is that the, the rods are mainly responsible for vision at low level lights, uh, shadow, darkness, and, and things like that. While the cones are more in charge of the perception of the color. Uh, that is what would is called photop photopic uh, vision. And there are three different types of, of cones. The ones in charge of receiving or, or recognizing red color, others which are recognizing blue color, and others which recognizes green color. So we have these three different types of cones, which in fact are the ones in charge of um, recognizing these colors which are send them some data to the brain, which is the one that interprets uh, the colors, determining a, a huge amount of colors rather than just these three colors, red, green, and, and blue. So if, if we go to the electromagnetic uh, spectrum, we see that uh, the, 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 the human vision is in the range of between 400 uh, to 700 uh, uh, na nanometers. And in this, uh, in this uh, range is where we have the, the, the blue, the green, and the red colors I mentioned with the photoreceptors. Um, only three channels. But what if rather than having three, we would, we would be able to have eight different channels? That would be excellent because that means more data, and more data means more information. And what if rather than um, just eight channels, we have uh, we have uh, some more. Or even if we have also some channels, not only in the visible range, but also in the near infrared channel or in the, or, or in the infrared uh, area. Um, these channels here, uh, we cannot see them with our eyes, with our own eyes, but there are some sensors that are able to, to capture that, that information. And by having all this information, all this data, we can create a lot of information related to the properties of the of the matter we are we are having seen we are seeing in the nature. So the difference between these these different ideas comes that we have we can have RGB images with just these three channels that the eye can see. If we have some more channels, we go to multispectral cameras, and if we have much more channels. Uh, we go to hyperspectral, and in hyperspectral, if we represent the intensity of the light, which is reflect, reflected in the in the objects, and we represent that or plot that against the wavelength, what we have is a continuous curve, and here comes the magic. This this curve is representative and unique for each uh, object in the nature, and that's the important thing of the hyperspectral uh, uh, cameras, because in that case, what we have is a uh, uh, not an image, but a hypercube, where we have the X and Y uh, axis with spatial information, and then we have a set axis with a spectral information. And within this spectral curve, each pixel is represented by a hyperspectral signature, which is what I mentioned before, is a characteristic 
of, of each element in the, in the nature. So that we can say that we can have a curve for, for example, for the water, which is the blue one, hyperspectral uh, signature. There is another curve, for example, for the snow, which is the red one, for the vegetation, the green one. So each of them are completely different from the other. So just by having these curves for each pixel, we can know, we, we are able to know which element we are having we, we are having in front of us, even if we cannot see them with our own eyes. For example, uh, what we can do is, uh, this is a, a RGB image of different plums, but if we apply hyperspectral technology, we can differentiate which are the plums and which of them have mold in it on, on, on them. And even if there are some plastics that we cannot see in the RGB image. So this is a good uh, application for, uh, for example, for food quality uh, industries. Uh, another example is this one. Uh, normally, if we have a look to paracetamol and ibuprofen from our own eyes, probably we will not be able to distinguish between which are which, which, which are them, uh, which is paracetamol and which is ibuprofen. But we, with hyperspectral and some easy algorithms, we can differentiate them uh, very easily. So somehow it's a, it's a way of seeing the invisible. Uh, it's, it's seeing th things that are not uh, visible to our own eyes. So in order to do that, we need our hyperspectral image sensors. Um, which in fact are divided in, in four different types. Um, first of all, at the top uh, left of the image, we see the, the Wisprung uh, scanning sensor. What they do is th they just take one pixel each time and for each time they get, they capture one pixel. What they do is uh, they get all the spectral bands for that pixel. So it's this Wisprung scanning here. Then we have the Pusprung scanning, what it takes is it captures one line at a, at a time, one line, another one, and another one, another one, another one, and so on. And for each line, you obtain all the spectra, all the channels of that line. Then it has the spectral scanning, which uh, gets the entire spatial information for all the bands at any time, at each, each time. And finally, we have the, the snapshot uh, scanning, which it, it takes is the fastest one, but it takes a uh, all the hyperspectral cubes at, at one time. So if you are looking for a good compromise between quality and speed and so on, and price and so on, uh, probably Pustrom post room is, the, is the best option. And for Pustroms, we, we have different cameras like these ones at the, our laboratory. Uh, these are a co from a company, from a company in Finland called Specking. And we have the FX10, which goes from 400 nanometers to 1,000 uh, to 1,000 nanometer, and then we have the FX17 that goes from 1,000 uh, or 900 nanometers to 1.7 uh, micrometer. Uh, so these are the two ones we are mainly using for for drones, with together with drone technology. But we have two other cameras from American companies, Edward that reaches 2,500 uh, nanometers, which is mainly devoted for geology, mining, and, and all different uh, kind of, of, of applications. Now, the thing is that with these kind of cameras, uh, as they are put through, and you have to take one line and then another line, another line, another line, what you need is some movement, some kind of movement, and you can do it in different ways. One way is by having the cameras completely fixed and then have a moving conveyor with all the samples moving on it and you just scan all the images of, of the object you want, the samples you want to, to detect or to study. That's one way. But the way in which we are doing in our laboratory, we have this, uh, this cube with the cameras here, which are in the rail and the sample here are, are fixed. And what you do is just move the cameras so that you scan all the samples. In this case, these are leaves from wine yards. Uh, in a project that we were working some years ago. Another option that we are doing is uh, with a microscope. We have a microscope with a hyperspectral camera included here. And it was created by us uh, together with, with the Olympus microscope. And then the samples I put here 
and the samples are moving also, are moving with a, an artifact we have created for having this scan it technique in the, in the microscope. And finally, another option is a, a, a drone that we have. It's a from DGI, it's Matrix 600 drone model uh, that in which we have adapted our one of our hyperspectral cameras to it, uh, so that the movement of the drone is the one that makes the movement for the camera. Now, there are some challenges when you are working with this technology. One of them, or some of them, depends on the application. Some of them are more complex than, than others, and you have to think a little bit how to solve some problems. But perhaps one of the main problems is, as, as you could imagine, you are not taking just three channels. You are taking, for example, hundreds or thousands of channels, and that's a huge amount of information that if you want to transmit that information or to store that information, you need to make some compression to it. So we are working on, on compression techniques, especially for onboard applications such as satellite drone drones or drones, not only to, uh, to, to reduce the memory requirements in those artifacts, but also to uh, use the limitation in the, in the communication channels in order to send data from a satellite to, to the Earth. And then within these compression techniques, you have different kind of techniques lossless, lossy, near lossless, and so on. Uh, and what you take at the advantage of the, of the spatial and spectral correlation between the different bands in order to make this reduction in, in the capacity of the, of the image in the, in the, I mean, in the compression. And then there are some standards which we have been implemented in, in different standards as Roberto will mention afterwards. And then comes the unmixing. Normally we can find that uh, some of the pixels in a hyperspectral camera uh, image can be composed of just pure pixels, but there are some pixels in which there is a combination of, of materials in it. So we have to detect which materials are in each pixel, and not only that, but which percentage of those materials you can find in each pixel, uh, which is what, what, what is called abundances. So all these techniques is what is called a mixing techniques, which is another, um, area in which we are working. And then another challenge is uh, to reduce prices. These uh, different cameras I have shown to you are in the order of 20,000 euro, 20, euros more or less, or 30 or even more than 100,000 euros, the one that reached 2,500 nanometers. So a way of reducing these, these, these prices is by using multispectral camera rather than hyperspectral camera. For example, this hyperspect, this multispectral camera is in the order of 8,000 euros. And that's one way of reducing costs, although the, um, the, the quality is not as good as the hyperspectral. This only has eight channels, while the hyperspectral has 224 uh, bands. And another way of reducing the cost is by designing your own multispectral camera, which is what we have done. We have created our own camera, which is a four channel multispectral camera like this one, um, in which very easily you can replace the filters in the top, uh, depending on the application for which you want to use them. I, I will talk about this afterwards because now it's the turn to Roberto in order to talk a little bit about some architectures that he's developing for mainly for satellites and things like that. So well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting us to to this summer school, it's, it's a very nice school. We are very happy to see many people attending this school. So uh, I will talk uh, about a subject that uh, maybe you consider that is in a strong age. Uh, we are talk we I will talk about uh, high performance computing on board satellites. When I will show you what is going on in this area, maybe you will think that uh, maybe stay on ground, no? But um, actually, this uh, this is a, a, a very competitive field. Uh, it has a, a very strong future because many countries, many governments are fighting for a, for a way uh, to be on the space. No? Also, you will uh, see that uh, uh, the the uh, the system that is now 
how it is now is not possible to maintain because it's too much information. Uh, so we have to reduce this information, uh, including some smart algorithms on the satellite. Well, um, <clears throat> I will uh, talk uh, about the, uh, these topics where you have to consider that in onboard satellite, you have many constraints that you are constrained by the unautonomous system that fly uh, by itself. Uh, also, you have radiation around, you have to take care of the radiation and you cannot uh, have very big uh, computer system because of power, space, etc. So <clears throat> as uh, you can see, I will talk a little about what is those constraints, including the hardware, the hardware on the satellite, how to mitigate the radiation effects, and later I will uh, provide you some examples of the projects we are doing right now. So first, uh, uh, before uh, Dora talk about the number of satellites, this is uh, in this slide you will see. Uh, a date, a number, but uh, sure it will change very soon. And uh, the number of, the most number of satellites are in the low Earth orbit. This is an orbit that is uh, below 2,000 kilometers. You will see here the number of satellites around the, the, of the Earth. And most of them are for Earth observation, 50% of them, and communication, 22% of them. So after that, this is the, the line mark outside is the gestionary satellites. The gestionary satellites look to a specific point in, in the Earth, so not moving around the, the Earth. And uh, in the medium is the medium Earth orbit that have uh, <clears throat> about, our satellites are, are uh, more or less in 10,000 kilometers uh, from the Earth. This satellite, for instance, is the, the GPS uh, system is in this area. Uh, the satellite you saw here is the Iridium, that is the communication satellite that is uh, about 780,000 uh, uh, kilometers, sorry, <laughs> 786 uh, kilometers from, from Earth. Oh, sorry. Okay, this is the information from ESA. And another point is that the number of satellites is growing exponentially lately. Most of these new satellites are commercial satellites, are launched for companies. And this is creating a new trend in the space. Uh, these satellites, these commercial satellites are very small. The design process is very short. The cost is very limited. So this is creating a need to new uh, ideas in the, in the satellite area. This uh, is called new space. So new space is a different trend than the current uh, uh, development of satellite by agencies and governments where the design periods are very long. The cost is huge and uh, the system have to work for many years. These small satellites don't need to be in the space many times because normally they are a, a constellation of satellites. If one fails, another one takes the job. So for this new space, it is uh, required the high performance computing in space. Uh, every time the satellite should be more intelligent. Another thing you can see here is that the, the debris in space is increasing a lot. So if you have ideas how to remove these debris, you will be uh, not rich, but you will get a lot of money from, from ESA or, or some government because this is a big problem. Well, this is the traditional uh, way of working that you use. For instance, uh, one of the uh, satellites acquires uh, hyperspectral images, as uh, Jose told before. You send that uh, image to ground, 
you store the image in a data center and the users just compute, make algorithms to compute and extract information. Uh, when you extract this uh, information and compute it, you will you can use high computing data centers with GPUs, uh, vector machines, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So the on board this um, satellites, the only process that the uh, is done is the calibration and correction of the image, such as atmospheric uh, uh, correction or geometric correction, etc. Sometimes uh, includes compression, but not many times. It is incredible, but uh, nowadays, no many satellites have compression on board. In the future, uh, this paradigm will change. So the users need to have uh, the information in real time and use that in, in uh, handheld devices. So you will have in the future in your mobile phone information in the satellite in real time, and you can do whatever you want to with this information. This uh, is a big problem for the for the satellite uh, area because you have to process this information on board. The idea is not to send many terabytes to ground, but send some kilobytes. Uh, to ground with the information, exactly information you are uh, demanding. No? This is also supported by the, because the downlink, so the connection between the satellite to the ground is almost saturated. There is no way to send more information on ground. All the bands are in in the almost saturated. Okay. Well. Let me uh, introduce now the what is the surrounding of your high-performance high computing on board. You have to leave your hardware and your algorithms have to live with the control of the satellite and other fun functions. So this is a typical uh, structure of the satellite hardware. It includes two different parts, the platform and the payload. Basically, what I am saying, uh, saying what we are seeing here is the, the subword architecture, that is the space avionics open interface architecture, that is a solution provided by ESA as a way to standardize all this development of the hardware satellite. As you can see there, there is a lot of uh, redundancy where the information is critical um, you have to provide power you have to provide clock uh, it's very exact clock etc etc so but we have to concentrate on the payload because there is where the high performance computing is so <clears throat> actually this uh, architecture is solved through Module, a modular system. So every part of the hardware satellite will be a module. But that is very good but because many manufacturers will develop hardware for a specific parts of the satellite. You don't have to worry much about uh, those uh, parts. This is the advanced data handling architecture modules. So um, um, it will be ready for you to, to install. But we have to concentrate on, on the payload. That is where the probably you can do some high performance compute. Well, actually, you have two limitations. One is that you have to deal with all the instruments that take the data. They are the the uh, visible and infrared and, and RGB uh, cameras. You have to deal with that. Also, there is another problem when you have you want to configure. Your system, you have to go through the telecommand and telemetry is, uh, entries of the satellite. So you have to depend on that. For instance, if you have a, a neural network and you want to change the, the weights, you have to remove the current weights and do an, uh, use another ones. You have to do it through this link that is very slow. So you have to consider that. Well, concentrating on this, that is. Um, two parts. 
the the first part is the as I say the instrument the instrument containing all the the cameras etc and the processing and formatting and control unit all this system is called the instrument uh, control and onboard data handling I am I put all this here because you will find if you are working on this you will find this these names in, in everywhere. So the concentrated on this system, you can see that the, the uh, processing and formatting and control unit can be in, includes the, for instance, the lossless and near loss compression and any kind of, of process you want to do to, to your uh, image or information. But also you have to deal with many things that are included in the satellite, like uh, distribute the telecommand and telemetry, distribute the power, distribute the timing, the clocks, et cetera, et cetera. Also, the satellites include a, a mass memory. Uh, some of them in, also maybe includes a DDR memory or even a hard disk. You can put a hard disk on the space. And in the instrument, the typical instrument you have is the the panchromatic uh, images that provides uh, non-color information but you have the the image the visible and near infrared and the uh, short wave infrared uh, instrument all those are connected to your system and maybe will provide you the information and the same time you have to Take care, take care of this. Uh, well, this is the that the, the system also includes some uh, in processing, initial processing, but normally this is provided by the manufacturer of the instruments. Okay, uh, this is the hardware around your system. Now let's see what happened with the radiation. I, I don't know if you are familiar with the radiation on the space, but uh, you can have in your system very hard errors. These hard errors will destroy your system and soft errors that you can uh, recover from it. The soft errors are produce information errors, but the hard errors produce malfunctioning devices. In the hard errors, the most typical is the total ionizing those. This means that the particles that are entering in your device are changing the way it works. If uh, your device is affected by the number of particles hitting it, maybe after a while, your device will not work more. And uh, the, there are other errors like the single event latch up that will destroy your device when only one particle. It is important that the all system that goes to space are radiation tolerant. At least they have to be uh, immune to the latch up and immune to the ionization dose uh, in the, due to the radiation. The soft errors uh, typically are called the deep flip. So your system have, for instance, zero and the radiation converter to one. This is the deep, uh, that big flips are the single uh, event upsets and the single uh, event transients. This is a problem that you can solve uh, in the algorithms and, and the adding redundancy, etc. cetera. Uh, but there are some devices that are that hard that uh, are immune also to these uh, effects. Well, uh, in the space, uh, this is the, the kind of device we, uh, we use. Uh, it's microprocessors and microcontrollers that usually are in the control of the satellite. So the, the microprocessors control the motors, the power, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, also, you can uh, include ASICs. Uh, for those that, that are not familiar with ASICs, are uh, integrated circuits that are defined from scratch. You define whatever you want to include there. The problem is that are very expensive. It takes a long time to design an ASIC. So 
they are not using in the space nowadays. Nobody uses that because it's too expensive for the space. What everybody is using in the space are FPGAs and multiprocessor trucks. Uh, FPGAs, as you know, are commercial devices that uh, you can configure. You can configure the whatever you want to do in this FPGA. You can do that with low level uh, programming like BSDL or with languages like C. Uh, I suppose none of you have been working with FPGA, never, no? No, but even so, <laughs> Amazon has a FPGA platform you can program from very high level, so you can you can try. Well, a multiprocessor socks uh, really uh, are a system that includes a couple or maybe three or four processors together with uh, some programmable logic. Well, uh, programmable logic, uh, I don't, I don't, I will not be. Uh, explaining everything here, you have to know only there are three types of programmable logic. The first one are basically memories. So you can do a memory when you can store the information of your system. You can configure the system with the memory. The second one is antifuse. Antifuse is uh, just a small um, uh, device that is in between two metal lines, you can program a connection or not. And and the final one is, uh, is the flash memory that you are familiar with because it's the, the technology that is in the pen drive or SSD, hard disk, et cetera. So the problem you have here is that the, all of these technologies resist different to the radiation. Uh, for instance, the best one are anti-fuse technology, but the most used one are the memories one because uh, you can do um, uh, FPGAs using memory uh, and the most advanced technology. You don't have to change anything. So the most used are the, the first one in, in the study run technology. You can see there some of the devices we typically use. This is one of, of the devices that are more uh, used in the space. It's a uh, FPGA uh, made by ceilings and is radiation tolerance. So you have to, uh, you can send it to the space, but you have to provide some information correction to for the bit lips. And basically it's a, it's a system that have many uh, gates and DSPs in the same circuit. And you can, uh, configure uh, that. So this is, we are working a lot with this device. The, oh, sorry, the second one is, is an European FPGA. This uh, will be used a lot in the space agency and also includes also uh, two microprocessors, uh, two arm microprocessors in the cortex air. So uh, a part of uh, memory, etc. So this device uh, is radiation tolerant and will be in the short future used a lot. Well, coming back to the radiation, actually <clears throat> this is a work done long time ago, but um, it represents the the in the horizontal axis is the, the distance from Earth, and the, in the vertical axis is the radiation you receive depending on, on this position. Is this uh, measured in red? And you can see the radiation come from protons, electrons, mainly from protons. And I picture three lines there, where the most used satellites are the blue, but at the low, uh, low Earth orbit. And if you notice, most of these satellites uh, don't receive a lot of radiation. So you can use commercial device in um, satellites that are below 1,000 kilometers. And this is what the, the uh, companies are doing. They're using commercial devices in this uh, low earth. 
Of course, you have to introduce uh, techniques to mitigate the errors, like uh, uh, duplicate or triplicate the hardware. Uh, if you triplicate the hardware, you can make a voting to know what is the correct result. Also, science provides uh, an, an IP that is the same that can is always scrubbing your system and knowing where when they uh, when an error exists and reset the the chip and start again. So many people is using commercial FPGAs on the satellites. This is a commercial uh, ceiling ultra scale that, uh, as you can see, have uh, two arm cortex A, two arm cortex R, and DDR memory, et cetera, et cetera. And also the blue area is a programmable logic. In this device, you can do a whole satellite. You can control all the functions of the satellite, do the, the links to ground and compute your signal processing, do your signal processing in this uh, microprocessor. Okay, finally, I will present two projects that we are currently doing with the Spatial Agency and some companies. First, uh, okay. Okay, so first, uh, what is the problem in space? That you have to specify every time you do a, a new project, you have to specify everything from scratch. So there is no solutions that are valid from one to other satellite. So this is a problem that we have to change. So the another thing is that you have to do, uh, you have to use a space standards. For instance, we use the CCS DS standards that create the standards for many areas in order to be compatible with ground system and other satellites. Problem also is that there is no many data for training your system. If you want to do artificial intelligence, you don't you don't have data for for training your system because your sensor is always different. So you have to train with other data and then adapt to the, the images you acquire or whatever. So, <clears throat> so the high performance uh, computing in the space is a heterogeneous computing. So you have to uh, do the, the processing in different kind of processors, uh, hardware, directly on hardware, et cetera, et cetera. So I will present the two examples. The first example is the Chime mission. Chime mission is a, a new hyperspectral imager for the Copernicus mission. Uh, this is this, uh, the satellite that will um, be used instead of Sentinel-2 in the future. The idea is the same. So it's Earth observation for uh, processing data in agriculture, biodiversity, onboard monitoring, etc. No? This, uh, for instance, Sentinel two years ago linked Iceland with our Iceland because uh, uh, it captures two volcanoes uh, erupting the same year. So uh, on the uh, on your right, there is a uh, Iceland volcano that I am not able to pronounce. And on the left is the Cumbre Vieja volcano that is in, in one of the islands of the Canary Islands in La Palma. This uh, sensor has only 13 bands, only 13 bands in the several uh, spectral uh, bands, but at only 13. The one we are doing, that is a, a project from European Space Agency, done in collaboration with Thales Alenia in Spain and France and ourselves. Uh, the, the one we are doing have 220 bands and the images provide you five, uh, 105,000, uh, uh, sorry, 1,500 uh, pixels, what we call samples. 
So the step ahead is incredible. The information is uh, incredible uh, high compared to Sentinel-2. Well, the idea of this satellite is that uh, it will be launched in 2008 and uh, the system has some kind of uh, intelligence so he will detect the clouds and remove the clouds from the images. So when you send to ground, it will decide not to send some images or if these cloudy images, the compression will be adapted to these uh, images. So it will do selective compression. As I said before, the, we will do everything on these devices from silence the Kinter Ultra, Ultra Scale uh, QU60. The processing should be in real time. So we have to process the information in real time at the clock frequency of 125 megahertz. This is a push broom, uh, hyperspectral images. So it will produce a line by line with all the, the bands. So in one capture, it will have 1,500 pixels plus 220 bands, okay. Okay, uh, the compression will be done within a standard, the one, two, three, B2 standard that is composite of a predictor and an encoder. The processing is very simple for uh, compare what you normally use uh, and you normally do. So the idea is that you see the sample, the current sample is the yellow and you predict that sample using the pixels surround it with the weight uh, of the pixels around it. It's, uh, you can do wide uh, local zooms and narrow local zooms, whatever you prefer. So this seems simple, but the algorithms, as you can see, have a feedback look. So you have to create, after the quantizer, uh, you take this value to create a prediction and you also have to create a sample representative. So a sample representative is what on ground will be computed to get the current uh, picture. No, you will have the sample representative plus the prediction, and that will create the current picture. After the mapper, uh, the mapper, sorry, the, you get the residual. So the idea is that the residual is much smaller than the current sample. So you have a compression effect there. So it was a long study to uh, decide how to remove the clouds. It was two different, uh, sorry, three different algorithms. So the, the yellow one was to take the sample of the clouds and use only part of the bits of this information. For instance, use only five most significant bits, uh, three most significant bits or one uh, significant bit. The dark blue, it was another idea. So when you detect a cloud, you set the residual to zero. So you remove all the information about the clouds. And the yellow, uh, uh, sorry, the blue, uh, the light blue is to compress the clouds and the rest of the data with different errors. After a thoroughly decision, we took the, the, the algorithm called DAE, this D-A-E, because the other two, we saw that they, after many simulations, creates outliers. So these outliers were translated to good pixels and was not good. Okay. So the system will be a, a super vector machine that will detect the clouds. Uh, and provides a, a mask with the pixels that are close to the compressor. And the compressor takes this mask and decide uh, with ratio of compression ratio for apply for clouds or no clouds. On Chrome, you, you can decompress and recover the cloud information. Okay. Well, this is, I, I will not, explain this much but uh, this is the whole system where you have the this uh, yellow uh, part of in the center is is the image is the memory that contains the image 
we processed on, on the right, the cloud processing, and on the left, there is the compression. So, uh, and as I told you before, on top, you can see how you have to configure the, compre the compressor. You have to provide the information through the telemetry port. So we have to configure this uh, according to the uh, telemetry of the satellite. Well, this is the same. This is the setup from the lab, and this is uh, the setup from the lab, including um, the FPA and the connection to the PC to demonstrate. As you can see, the the FPA is not the the one we will use finally because this is a commercial version. It is very important to have a commercial version in the lab because it's very cheap compared to the the one that is going on the satellite. Okay, uh, the other project is the video uh, imaging device for Earth observation. This is a European project and it's finished. Uh, oh, yes, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, uh, Basically, most of the time you decide the algorithm depending of not of the quality, but if it fits uh, the system. So in this case, we have uh, uh, the compressor plus the SBM, but you have to consider that you, we have to repeat all these three times. So we will have three instance of the compression and three instance of the super vector machine, okay? And that's because it was this. We consider other solution, but it was beyond of the possibilities to include that. Okay. okay this um, <clears throat> video, uh, this uh, European project tries to set new standards in all the satellite system, including the the way to fabricate it, the way to fabricate the mirrors, and the intelligence inside the the satellite so the project is an european project with these companies Thales alenia polyshape pixalis amos and the only university are our university our group and the idea is that uh, we have to take uh, the information from this sensor this sensor done by pixalis is a huge sensor for for space has 48 megapixels and provides 10 frames per second in the high definition video. And uh, the idea is that we will install this on the satellite and we will follow targets on uh, the vision of this, on the area of division of the satellite. So the satellites will have two modes. The first mode is called image mode where you have a huge image of 48 uh, pixels, 48 megapixels. And in this image, you look for targeting one object. When you detect one object, the satellite automatically goes to the video mode. In video mode, we will have a crop region. It's a small uh, region of interest. And the satellite is able to follow this uh, objective for a while, not very long, but for two minutes, that is in space is a lot. So <clears throat> we have here a compression and target detection, okay? And the compression will be selective because you have very big region, we will compress a lot, and you have a small region where there is important information, we will compress no, uh, very little or, or almost nothing. So the idea is to, for, I, I will not talk about the compression. I will talk about the, the uh, target detection. In target detection, we decide to go for a, a convolution neural network. And the idea is to do that in two phases. In the first phase, we will train the, uh, the convolution neural network with the information on ground, the information that basically is in Google Earth, et cetera. And when the mission starts, we will be able to 
modify the weights of the convolution neural network on a space based on the real data that the satellite is producing. I put there two papers if you are interested in, in this information. Though after analyzing a lot of convolutional neural networks, same than before, we have to decide to, we decided to use mobile net architecture. And actually the shallow option of the mobile net architecture because it fits in our FPGA. Okay. And also we do a, a small version with all the filters of this uh, uh, mobile network, we divide it by four. If the mobile network includes 16 filters, we use four, etc. Which is the idea. So the idea is, is the picture on, on, the, on your right. So we will have the big image, but not at the same time. The, the sensor will produce line by line. When we have enough line, we will look from uh, left to right for, for a object to detect. And when you detect that object, we will do the crop. Okay, this is the, the basic idea of this uh, project. The project is also using the same uh, FPGA and here is, is uh, the architecture including both the uh, neural network and the uh, compression. This is uh, very complicated because it takes almost the full FPGA. It's 75% of the FPGA. I, I don't, <clears throat> if you are interested, I can explain it later. So this uh, basically is what I wanted to tell you. As conclusion, you have to consider that is in a concept um, now in a space is called new space. So a small satellites, uh, small prices, uh, long time, uh, sorry, short times to define it and to launch it. Uh, uh, also high performance uh, computing in space is based on FPAs. 99% of the times because of the power consumption, uh, space, etc., is, is um, suitable, and also the those uh, two projects. And finally, I, for those of you that are interested to research in this area, I see these uh, four topics. Uh, one is the uh, versal device from ceilings A and B. This is a huge device. Maybe with this device, you are more comfortable. <laughs> It includes uh, artificial intelligence, several ARM processors, include a DSP engine, a programmable logic, and even a network on a chip. So everything is connected through a network inside. Another uh, area of research is the RISC processor. RISC processor is, is now becoming a standard also in space. No, you <clears throat> can see that the, the European Space Agency did a workshop uh, <clears throat> late last year. And uh, maybe this is the link between uh, high performance computing on ground and on board, because it will share the same ecosystem, probably. <clears throat> Another is the GPUs. I didn't talk much about GPUs because in, in space, uh, for instance, the European Space Agency don't use GPUs. That is because uh, the GPUs manufacturers don't provide much information, but many people is doing GPUs and send, sending it to, to, to the space. So I'm trying to know what's going on with the radiation, et cetera, et cetera, so GPUs. Well, I'm, I may be quantum computing, but you will have a specific sensor for quantum computing. No? This is all what, if you have any question or no, yes, yes, please. GPUs are protected against radiation at this moment. Could you explain in video, for example? They are not protected, but uh, the the thing is that uh, the researchers have noticed that the, as the technology advances, so the new technologies are more robust than the previous technology. So if you use uh, devices using 
20 nanometers or so they they behave uh, correlate in below this uh, below this 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 limit so and we expect that the, in the future with this five nanometers technology it will be it will be better so this is my, my next question is that it would be possible to increase the number of uh, processing stages to perform on board if it's possible to have for example GPU that I think that are more powerful than PDAs for a for different this is the idea the problem is the power consumption so for, for instance uh, the virtual device that is uh, will be a huge device it will be launched in, in late this year uh, have a problem of power uh, consumption because in the space you cannot put a, a fan you have to take out the 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 warm or the the heat some way basically through um, mounting dissipators or whatever and this will be the big problem so if you uh, solve that maybe you can send uh, gpus more powerful gpus yeah. Yes. Thank you for the very nice presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, actually, I have a general question about the onboard compression. Uh, recently, there are a lot of works using deep learning for data compression, especially visual data compression, and they are getting like better results sometimes than conventional compression methods. Uh, and following the, uh, the comment that there are going to be GPUs available on board probably in the future, are there any uh, work going on developing deep learning based compression methods for like onboard compression? Yes, there, there is uh, some researchers working on on compression using deep learning uh which company you know, oh, I, I can tell you uh, because i know some papers i can provide you the paper i don't remember but the, the problem is that uh, okay you you can do uh, uh, compression uh, using uh, uh, convolution neural networks or whatever on the space but you have to decompress on, on on ground so this is because we are using the standard because uh, the standard is completely defined and everybody can decompress the image so maybe if uh, somebody do the compression using these techniques have to uh, pack the information in a way that it could be um, decompressed on ground in, in uh, using standards or whatever but it's a trend very important in the future our experience with the convolution neural network that we did is that it has to be improved because it takes a lot of area, but it's very promising. Yes, it's very promising if uh, even you can use the same network for several things. You can decompress, you can detect objects, etc. So it will be a pure research line in the future. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was really very interesting presentation. I have two questions. Uh, the, the first one, uh, for CHAMS uh, project, you said the budget is around uh, 455 uh, million, right? I wonder oh, okay. uh, the, the ratio for, us. <laughs> for, for, for this kind of work there. Uh, uh, this is the first question. And the second question is regarding the, the private uh, Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Regarding the four millions? 455 yeah. is the total budget. It's the total budget. Yeah, I, I wonder uh, the, the the amount for, for this kind of work. So basically okay. uh, working on um, um, on board uh, data processing. So yeah. uh, how much budget do you have there? Uh, that's my first question because it is an important topic that is emerging, but at the same time, is there really uh, also represented in, in in the budget? That's what I I wonder. The second thing is, uh, what is the situation regarding the private sector? Because uh, okay, here we saw a, a project for, from ESA. I think NASA also has a similar project, but we have in fact a, a, a private companies which provide high resolution satellite images, right? So planet, etc. So. Uh, 
what's their approach uh, for for this kind of onboard processing? Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, the, the well, uh, first question is the project in space are very expensive, but uh, one important part of, of this budget is for launch the satellite to make all the satellite structure, et cetera, et cetera. So also the devices are very expensive. So this um, device, uh, including the Q60, could cost maybe 100,000 euros, uh, plus the board you have to do, the test, the tests are incredible large. So you have to test temperature, radiation, uh, uh, vibration, shock, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is cost. So for design, uh, there is not much money, but uh, is uh, our <laughs> our project in in we with Thales share about uh, half a million euros for for this design. And the commercial satellites they are completely free. So they are doing they are being very aggressive. Uh, in the in the design, so they are trying to reduce the cost as much as possible, doing the the satellite as much as possible, and including commercial device uh, because of the cost, and trying to uh, using algorithms to uh, make it it robust uh, uh, against the radiation. So uh, we have been in contact with uh, several companies doing commercial. Um, uh, satellites and approaches is, is, is very is completely different. So they are not very conservative. So that's because I think that uh, that people sending GPUs to the space. What will happen if I lose a satellite that costs hundred thousand euros? Doesn't matter. But if you lost a satellite that costs ten millions, it's it's a huge problem. So so the number of companies. And the number of countries that are sending satellites are increasing a lot. So many countries from uh, Africa, et cetera, want to have a satellite uh, on, on, on <clears throat> around the ground, and so around the earth. So it will increase a lot. So it's a very demanding. We need engineers also. <laughs> so the, the companies in this area are seeking for engineers in the world all days. <laughs> so um, thank you for the presentation. Actually, I have a question regarding the software parts yeah. because uh, you present a lot of things regarding FPGAs, regarding uh, multiple processors. But uh, with GPUs, we have Blast, we have CUDA, we have a lot of works. Um, how can we compare to something where uh, a small amount of people are actually optimizing, yeah. uh, for example, neural network yeah. on those devices? Um, I mean, is this uh, lost by advance to try to do it on, I mean, on the specific uh, devices, or should we just put more work on it? Uh, I'm trying to catch your question. You're talking about this so doing it in software instead of hardware or yes uh, do, do we need to invest a lot of into software optimization yeah to work uh, with spgas yes for example yeah well uh, basically um everything is, is very optimized by, by the specific case so for instance for chime we already have uh, the compressor done but we have to do almost twice because uh, we have to optimize them specifically for this satellite. But uh, at now I think that the, most of people is doing FPGAs, but in the short future, I, I think the solutions based on software will, will increase. I am not talking about the control of the satellite, but it, this is all software. So you, do, you use microprocessors and do all software. But in, in future, I see the signal processing on board also will be uh, software. Uh, for what is the problem with the spatial agency? That uh, doing software is a nightmare. So
So you have to do so many steps to qualify your software that uh, particularly our group, we are not doing so far <laughs> because it's, it's even easier to do the, the design of the hardware. So this is the, but for commercial application as I seen in the future will be software. And this, and this software uh, probably uh, will be changed on fly. So you will change the, the, the satellite mode or the satellite functioning. Like if you uh, update your phone, mobile phone, seems like that, yeah. Thank you very much. Well, thanks also for connecting this this file that we've got on topic. This file is getting very very Yes, we'll be working on this file soon. So I I I think it will be very important for high performance computing and also for. for... I have fifteen minutes more. Sure. Ten fifteen. Okay, so it's, it's just to mention some of the projects in which, in which we are working, apart from, from these ones that Roberto mm -hmm. mentioned. Uh, the first one is, is also related with space. So the camera I mentioned before, um, which is this multispectral camera, which is here that we have designed in our lab, we are introducing it in, in a CubeSat. In fact, it's a, a three unit CubeSat. A single unit is just 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. This one is 13 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. And in that CubeSat, we are putting our camera, some batteries, and some uh, onboard PCs that will basically be a, a Jetson Nano plus uh, an Arduino. And the idea for this camera, uh, which is very simple to, to develop, is, is this, this, this diagram here. The camera is composed of four different cameras, which are synchronized with this microcontroller which is controlled at the same time, but this Jetson Nano. And in front of each camera, you have the lenses and four optical uh, filters for just obtaining four different channels, RGB and plus one uh, near infrared uh, channel, which is this one here. So by using this camera, the application we're going to give is to detect contaminants uh, and plastics in the, in the sea, in the ocean. So this is the main idea. So probably the idea is to send this, this, this camera to the space. Let me clarify this space in, in a minute. Uh, by, by September is when we, we were planning to finish the camera. And it's, it will not be in a low, low, low uh, Earth orbit because we are planning just to put it in a stratospheric uh, balloon uh, in order to put it not in a low Earth orbit, but at 25 kilometers of, of height with this uh, uh, company called Vito Space. They have made some testing also in, in different ships in the Canary Islands. This is, this is one of the Canary Islands. It's, in fact, it's La Gomera. Um, so in September, we will do this launch of, of, of our camera to, to 25 kilometers of height in order to test the camera and to do some processing, some communication with LoRa devices and, and, and things like that. So this is... Uh, one of the projects. Another project in which we are working for the Spanish uh, government uh, is uh, about creating a spaceport, but this, this is a special spaceport because it's an offshore spaceport, a, a spaceport which will be in the water around the Canary Islands. Right now we have different spaceports in, in all over the world, but the main five uh, spaceports are these five that are located here. And in fact, these two ones here probably will not be used anymore because of these problems that we have right now with Russia and, and, and this, on all these wars and things like that. So probably we will be using these five ports here. And number five is, is, is in Kourou, which is typically the official space port for, for European satellites mainly. Uh, and if you have a look to, to where they are located, they are basically located as soon as they are located close to the equator, which is the set of grades, um, that, that, that's much better. So the Canary Islands are more or less at the same latitude as Cape Cañaveral. And um, so we are looking right now is to create a, a spaceport to put in the water in space, in, in, in the Canary Islands, in order to send to the space 
small satellites. It's an idea similar to this one, uh, which is being created in, in Germany. It's not exactly this one, it's mostly similar to this other one, which was done by the Italian government some years ago in front of Kenya. Uh, and it's also similar to some of the platforms that Elon Musk has been decided in the United States. So right now what we have done is to make a, a feasibility study for the Spanish government. It was a 1 million euros uh, study that we just presented to the Spanish government one, two weeks ago. And now it's a political decision if they want to build or not this, uh, this space port that probably would be not only for Spanish uh, satellites, but also for European satellites. So that's another project in which we are working. The third one is uh, by using this multispectral camera and hyperspectral camera is to use them for another application as, as, as it is precision agriculture. So in the future, uh, future farms will be composed of, of drones uh, uh, with special sensors and different smart tractors with other sensors, sensors in the cows in order to know about the, the health of the cows, of the pigs and so on. Then we will have small houses here with the operator just sat very comfortable having a look in his screen of how the cows are sick or the pigs are just uh, getting disease and things like that. So it will be very comfortable uh, farmer. Um, and it, this is how it will look like a farm in the future. And in order to do that, um, uh, there is a big uh, research area on working on, on precision farming, mainly because of the increase of population in the world. So in, in some years, there will be a huge population. Uh, we will reach, I don't know, in, in year 2000, 2000 and, and, and 100, we will reach something like eight, eight, 18, uh, 11 billion uh, inhabitants in the world. In fact, it's, 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 it's but just like curiosity, right now, it seems that right now, the China is, is not the, the most populated country, but right now is India. And probably Nigeria will be in San Gias, the third most populated country. And we have to look for a solution in quantity and in quality in order to feed up all these people with good quality and good quantity of products in the farming. So that's one of the motivations in order to work on, on precision agriculture. Uh, and also another motivation is, is because of the lack of water. If you have a look, it's incredible to see how in order to create one kilo of rice, you will need more than 3,000 liters of water, for example. So you have to take care of water and this precision agriculture is a way of managing all this lack of, of water. Um, so with these multispectral cameras and hyperspectral cameras, you can just observe from the space, just in a satellite or in a drone, the difference between healthy trees, which has a, a special a hyperspectral signature, from uh, trees which are infected with any kind of disease, which has a totally different hyperspectral uh, signal. So if you do that for every pixel in an image, you will be able to detect where there are some diseases in your, in your crops and things like that. There is another example here. This is for, for, for wineries, for the grapes in the winery. So the, 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 the blue, I mean, the blue curve is a healthy wineries and grapes while the other one is infected with mildew, which is a disease in the, in the, in the wineries. So you can detect that also from, from a drone. You can even detect from the drone where you have dry soil or wet soil in order to make a better homogeneity of the, of the watering uh, resources in your, in your crops. So all these things are helping with these multispectral cameras in drones. And the reason why you can detect if a plant is healthy or is stressed is very simple. In a healthy uh, plant, what happens is that the light in the infrared is much more reflective than in the red channel. While if the plant is stressed, more or less they are reflective the same amount of, of quantity. So just by having a look to, to how the light is reflected in the infrared and in the red, you can create a very small uh, expression, equation, which goes from minus one to plus one. If it is close to plus one, that means that the plant is okay, it's healthy. If it is minus one, it's, it's dead. So that's the way in which you can uh, transfer these numbers for each pixel 
to a false color image in order to give it to the farmer, telling them, okay, all the things that are in red means that you have problems in that area of your crop. If they are in green, just don't go there. You can continue just working on other things because the crop is healthy in that part. So that, that's, that's the thing that we give to the, to the farmers with this project. And we do that with our special drone, hyperspectral drone, with, with the camera, hyperspectral camera, which is here. And in order to do that, we have to create some 3D pieces. We put a GPU here, uh, some more electronics and things like that. We make some testings uh, together working with agriculture, some farmers and so on. And we obtain similar images like this one in which the blue color means these are soil. Uh, the red one means healthy plants. And then you go from red one, which is healthy, you go to orange, you go to yellow, you go to green, according if the plant is losing in quality or not. In fact, there was a curiosity here when we first took this, this, this map and we gave it to the farmer. We told them that there was a problem here. Probably there was a problem here because there was almost no red here in this binary. And we went there with the farmer and the problem was that the water was not reaching to that part. And because of that, the crops was too weak in that, in that part there. And they fixed that, that part. Uh, so what we are doing now is that drone I mentioned before, this one here, let me check, uh, sorry. This drone here um, is too expensive. Just the drone is around 15,000 euros plus the camera, which is another 15,000 that makes 30,000 euros plus the engineer work and things like that. We cannot sell down to a farmer. So what we are doing right now is we are creating not only our own uh, multispectral cameras, but also our own drone. And we go from 30,000 uh, 30, 30, euros to more or less 2,000 euros, which is what it costs the multispectral, which is around 1,000, plus the drone, which is also 1,000 euros only. We, we buy piece by piece and we just create them, put the engines, uh, make the programmation, and it's everything automatically. So in less than 2,000, or 3,000 euros, you can have a product like, like this with the camera with the camera we have created, which is the, that one over there, that one over there. And this is just some testing of this camera. This is a football pitch in, the, in our university. And in this area here, we have some palm trees. And this is the, the image we have obtained with our um, multispectral camera in order to know if the, if the trees are okay or not. Red means that they are okay. And if you see in the extremes of the, of the palm trees, they are becoming yellow because probably they have some problems. Another project in which we are working right now is about uh, environmental science. Again, with the same multispectral camera in the Canary Islands and in Gran Canaria, we have a, a very big and important scientific facility for, for marine science. It's called PLOCAN, which comes from Oceanic uh, Canary Platform. And it's inside of the, of the sea, as you can see here. And, and the good thing is that it's, it's also surrounded by a big area of 23 kilometers square that you can use for testing anything that you want to do that, to, to do there. So we have a, making some a, alliances with this, with this center. And, um, and what we are doing with them is to analyze oil spills, detection of, of, of uh, plastics and things like that. And we are working on that together with, with our drones and with our uh, multispectral cameras. Uh, we have created new indexes, uh, indices for detecting oil spills rather than other ones that are well known from the literature like, like these ones. And these um, oil spill indices permit us, this is the one that we have created, permit us to detect clearly uh, where the oil spills can be found. And this is done with, with historical images. In fact, this is from an image which was, which was used um, from this, uh, from this uh, Gulf of Mexico in, in year 2010, from an accident that we have there. So we use that image in order to test our uh, oil indices. And what we are doing right now is also to put this camera uh, for this oil spill detection, to put the camera in a new drone we are fabricating which is a, a VTOL, which means a, a vertical uh, takeoff and land uh, drone. So it has fixed wings, but it, it just elevates 
in vertical and then it flies like, like a plane. And what we are doing is to cover all the wings with solar cells so that the endurance of this drone will be around six hours together with the camera, which will be uh, installed below of the, of the drone. So that's a project that we started uh, at the beginning of this year together with two companies in the Canary Islands and it will be finished in two years. Another idea is uh, to put the camera in a bigger drone. This one is, is another drone with which we are working from a company called Singular Aircraft. It's a 4,000 kilos drone. It's a plane with no pilot and it has an endurance of 25 hours. So we are planning to put our camera and other equipments here in the, in, the, in the plane. And we are working with the company since two years ago in order to use it for not only for detecting oil spills in the sea, but also for, for fire uh, extinction and detection. And also in order to look for pirates, uh, uh, bar, uh, ships in the sea and things like that. So that's a long relationship we have with this uh, singular aircraft. And finally, just the last project in which we are working, all this technology, which comes mainly from, from the space, we are applying them also uh, in hospitals for health applications. In particular, this is a, a project that, that is finished now. It's a European project called Helicoid, in which we use the cameras, the same cameras, hyperspectral cameras, in order to detect tumors in the brain while doing the surgery in, in real time, uh, while doing the surgery uh, together with the with the hospital, in hospitals in Gran Canaria and also in, in, in England, in the United Kingdom. So what we have done in this project is to create databases, to create some, connect some cameras with some high performance computing and things like that, uh, using classification technology the techniques and doing databases that are shared in, in different articles for anyone who could, who wants to use these, these images of, of, of tumors, hyperspectral characterization of tumors. And this is the how it looks like. Uh, we have created somehow, it's a, similar to a robot, where you have the cameras here in the front. Here are the surgeons working on the brains. And this is the real brain. And these are false color brains with uh, the colors painted according to the hyperspectral signatures we have obtained from, the, from, the, from our uh, Bisnir cameras. And I think that that's all. Yeah, that's all. So I don't know if there is any further question about this project. Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for the talk. Um, so my question was, at the beginning, uh, you discussed how for the hyperspectral imaging, you could basically do uh, a decomposition of what type of, of land surface covers could be contributing to a single pixel. And then for the medical image, you also had a false color image. And I was wondering whether the false colors were just a representation of the spectrum or whether they were actually also elements of the decomposition into certain contributors. And if it was the latter, whether that wouldn't be potentially dangerous with your idea of not telling the surgeon what a tumor is or not, because then you would basically be importing some kind of model knowledge into the image. Well, first of all, it's, it's just an experimental phase. So we are just having uh, the input from the, medic, from the medical people in order to know if it could be worth or not for them. Yeah. That's one thing. The second thing is that when they are making the surgery in, in the with the open brain, open brain, there are a lot of liquids, and sometimes uh, they cannot see exactly where the borders of the of the tumors are. Yeah. So the good thing about hyperspectral is that the hyperspectral signature is totally different for cancerous uh, tissues than from healthy tissues. Okay, so and by doing that, you can color it uh, each different tissue depending on the signature you obtain with the, with the spectral camera. Right. And so to the medical, to the medical personnel, that uh, false color image in order to know exactly where the border of the tumor is. Right. That's the main idea. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> thanks for the thanks for the talk. Actually, my question is: Do you plan to make uh, regarding your drones uh, open source drones? Uh, like uh, right now, many labs have access to three D printers and things like that. And have you thought about developing three uh, D three D printable uh, drones or 
to, to make it really cheap so then many labs can experiment with with yeah. spectrum okay so our first step is uh, what we would like in the in the first phase is to create a database with for example different kinds of tropical fruits with the the the, the spectral signature of different kinds of tropical fruits that's one thing the first thing we want to do secondly with the drones our idea would be to uh, certify the drones in order to sell them to a company in order to start commercializing but certifying a, a drone is, is is not easy and we are not uh, prepared or not have not have do not have experience in certifying drones so probably what we would do is something as you mentioned put some videos or some papers that we have written telling how to build them and things like that and the main idea you have to take into account is that uh, depending on the weight you want to put to the drones, you have you will have to buy different engines, and we will put some data on which engine to put. Depending on the, we would do all of that in in some uh, open access uh, papers and things like that in order to share that with anyone who wants. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. Oh. So um, I think for the talk, I find it it's insane that you guys can lower the cost to like two thousand dollars, two thousand euros for yeah. the drones and the cameras and etc. Um, I think the hyper spec surveys that you do for the farmland is incredible because um, I am a environmental scientist back home, and we sometimes do these scans too for a lot of the beef farmers and it ranges from 500 to a thousand depending on 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 the sizes so how much do you usually charge for your scans and surveys to these farmers and how do they um um and how do they react to it when they get the map of that survey okay now, right now there are two different types of business you can do with with the farmers one of them is some companies that give a service and you pay for a month and they make a one flight every week and they give you a map every week. And that, that's a, a way in which the farmer can get benefit of that. The other, the other business or, or idea is that you put in your winery business a personnel which is able to fly with the drone. You buy your own drone like this once or whatever and you start flying every time you want. So these are the two ways you have. But this has sense, it has sense if you have a big, a large crop area. If it is a small, you can do it. If it's like this room, you don't need that. You just walk every day just for, 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 for 10 minutes and that's all. Our idea right now is, is not to commercialize this because we, we do not work on commercializing, but on, on doing research. If a company comes and wants to buy this idea and these drones and things like that, we could sit in order to talk about funding and budgets and things like that. But right now we are in the phase of just making it possible, making it realistic uh, to do advice to the farmers in order to know about this technology and then they can decide if they want to buy or not. But that will be in a second phase. Yeah. And one last question. If someone like me who wants to learn more about the project, how does one get involved? Oh, you can come to our university. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the same as to any of you. I mean, I don't know if it is bad or not to mention here that that uh, as you see in the beaches at the beginning, it's an excellent place to go. <laughs> so any of you who want to visit us and stay with us a month, working with us, uh, with Roberto, with me or with any of us, just, uh, I don't know if I put my email there, but if not, during the dinner, I can give you some cards or my emails, our emails. And if you want to visit us for some months, as we have received, we have received people from China, from South America, from Germany, from France. We have a lot of, well, the last one is one that came from you from, from Croatia and things like that. So we are, and we are very friendly. <laughs> <laughs> so, most of my talk is not going to be about remote sensing. It's mostly about the Icelandic HPC and the infrastructure what we have here in Iceland. Okay. So myself, uh, Hemnathan, you can call me He-Man. Uh, that is the short name <laughs> most of the people call in the in Iceland. And I'm a research assistant professor in uh, computer science department. Uh, my background is in uh, physics and uh, I did a PhD in physics and then 
I started uh, working on modeling and uh, simulations of uh, materials. And uh, I moved to Iceland like uh, three years back. And uh, recently I started this uh, quantum simulation and the uh, data science lab. So I will just, uh, okay. It's a way slow, but uh, let's hope it comes. Uh, this, uh, I will just uh, talk about the brief outline about the, uh, okay. Bit annoying, but that's uh, fine. Okay, so this is uh, like uh, I will briefly talk about this Icelandic National Competence Center, which uh, it's like uh, we provide the HPC and AI support, and uh, what are the infrastructure we have in Iceland, uh, and also in terms of the Iceland and uh, Euro HPC JU, and uh, also some of the activities what we are doing in uh, Iceland, mostly. Uh, organizing workshops and uh, training, some events, and uh, some research work in terms of the international partnership and collaboration, and also some applications. I, th this is the only, I kept only one slide on remote sensing because I, I thought that is relevant for this, and also some uh, natural language processing, some applications related to that. So this uh, Icelandic National Competence Center, I will just wait until okay so we have 12 labs which were established under this uh, hood uh, national competence center so bas the basic idea is that idea is like uh, all the european unions like uh, all the countries in the european union have one national at least one national competence center and the idea is to provide uh, some assistance to academia uh, industries and uh, also the governing bodies uh, in terms of hpc and ai support so that is the uh, generic idea of NCCs. And uh, we have so far 12 simulation and data science labs. And uh, one of them is the remote sensing, ne neuroscience, computational chemistry, physics, and there are different sorts of labs. And uh, the generic idea is uh, like, uh, uh, so we have mostly do EU co collaborations with uh, mostly with the GAC, ULIC Supercomputing Center in Germany. And uh, also like, uh, promote competence in terms of HPC, AI, and also digital transformation through EDIH. EDIH is the new uh, uh, grant which we got in Iceland, which is European Digital Innovation Hub. Basically, the idea here is to like uh, transform the technology, uh, technology to the small and medium uh, uh, entrepreneurs, like uh, industries and uh, this kind of stuff. So how can you get access? Uh, Iceland is a small country, so getting access to uh, HPC is sometimes uh, non-trivial. And uh, here I just briefly mention how usually we get access to this uh, HPC. And uh, so in Iceland, we have ELIA, that is uh, uh, the small uh, uh, HPC cluster we have, and it is like uh, something around the terra teraflops, which is a uh, and uh, which is very small, but uh, we are still like uh, expanding the HPC cluster in Iceland. And apart from that, we mostly use the deep system in Germany, which is like from the ULIC supercomputing center. And uh, most uh, one can, if uh, it is the uh, academia or uh, some small and uh, if it is a research purpose, you can get a free access for most of these clusters. And if it is a small and medium entrepreneur, you can also get a free access if it, until it is a collaboration, if it if it goes beyond a certain point, then uh, we ask the people to uh, like uh, the industries to move to different domain like uh, uh, cloud platforms or other resources. And uh, we, apart from like Elia and uh, Ulic Supercomputer Center, we also have access to Lumi System, which is like uh, we, uh, Iceland is a part of uh, a shareholder for this Lumi. And it is, uh, Lumi is uh, one of the uh, hosted in Finland. And uh, we also apply for the Eero HPC, JU call, like uh, HPC calls. And right now this portal is also open for uh, SMEs, which is like uh, small companies which are interested to do like uh, HPC simulations. And uh, yeah, uh, in terms of the data, like for suppose there are some companies which are, which needs a uh, petabyte of, uh, uh, data access and for them like we are actually uh, in the process of uh, uh, pro uh, 
doing research and uh, providing some assistance. And uh, the last one is like mostly like uh, this is regarding the governing bodies. Like uh, there are some statistics institute in Iceland and a couple of uh, uh, government institutes like the hospitals and they need some common data platform. And we are also in the uh, process of uh, talking with them and trying to host uh, data and sharing infrastructure. And uh, so some of the activities include uh, uh, this uh, bi-monthly HPC community workshops where people from like uh, HPC experts or AI experts come, or even from the companies, they just pitch off the ideas like what they are doing in terms of the uh, uh, usage, like uh, what kind of HPC usage they are doing. And uh, also like uh, people from academia, from a, a remote sensing, uh, like a center for remote sensing, and also like uh, different uh, domain experts, they just come come and uh, like uh, present a 15 minutes general talk and then uh, pitch off the idea like what they are doing. It's just a open platform for everyone to come and uh, exchange ideas. And uh, this is mostly funded by the EROCC project. And uh, we have so far 10, it's a bi-monthly event and we have so far uh, 10 events happen. And uh, in terms of the training material, uh, most of the uh, material was available on YouTube. Uh, these are the mostly courses uh, on HPC or uh, cloud computing. Uh, these uh, courses can be accessed from uh, uh, Morris uh, uh, YouTube channel, actually. And uh, okay, in terms of the collaboration, okay. Okay, in terms of the collaboration, most of the collaboration is with the Ulix Supercomputing Center. And we have a joint simulation and data labs uh, who are co members of both the Ulix Supercomputing Center and Iceland uh, NCCs. And uh, we also have uh, participated in this uh, Center of Excellence, which is a race project for HPC and AI. So we do uh, lead a one of the work package in that. And also, like uh, in terms of the other activities, we are also like uh, collaborating on the Castell Quantum Con Computing Work Group. So, and the last one is this uh, EDAHIS. This is the one which is uh, mostly helping the uh, the industry, the companies, and uh, do the technology transfer between the uh, uh, from companies. If they need any assistance, I will talk about some of the use cases where. Uh, uh, yeah, the companies are interested in collaborating with the academy, like and doing some simulations. And uh, so why use HPC? I'm not sure, like this is the, I mean, most of the people might already know why HPC, but uh, okay. There are two domains which uh, I just uh, highlight uh, because these are the two use cases which at least uh, most of the people in Iceland are working on. Like uh, you can have a faster training of AI models, which you can speed up. Like uh, you can accelerate how you do this uh, simulations uh, or even like uh, how you can train your uh, AI models or in terms of the accuracy, how to get improve your uh, AI models better and better. So in order to do that, uh, uh, it's like, a, okay. Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> So, okay, uh, in, in terms of the AI or HPC framework, like, uh, so one of the framework was uh, developed in this uh, Center of Excellence, Excellence Race Project, which is unique AI framework. And uh, we are using this framework for most of the projects, uh, uh, like most of the other projects which we are working on. And so for uh, in terms of the, these companies like Travel is one company which is working on this acoustic uh, uh, modeling, like uh, uh, they want to basically model uh, how a person feels uh, the acoustics when you are in the building. Okay, they want to do the simulation before you construct the building. So it's a kind of a, so that is what the travel is working on. And then we have this uh, mid end is the another company which is uh, mostly working on the Icelandic language, like uh, Icelandic being a, uh, a small uh, community language. So it's like uh, people are working on how to like uh, use uh, open AI and uh, these kind of uh, uh, tools to uh, improve, I mean, uh, make use of uh, 
uh, new tools. And also this uh, CFD is the computation fluid dynamics. This is a uh, one project with the IceWind. IceWind is a uh, wind turbine uh, company, which is like, uh, they're trying, they're making uh, 3D models using uh, printers, like uh, 3D printable models. And then basically they want to use it for, uh, uh, install it on a telephone towers. Uh, most of the telephone towers, which are in the off grid, they rely, they use uh, diesel uh, uh, engine as a backup. And uh, we want, uh, Icewind wants to replace that uh, in terms of, uh, go towards the clean energy and uh, they want to use uh, uh, this uh, wind energy as a backup uh, generator. And so basically th these are the, like, uh, these are different uh, labs and how they are associated with the, with the one or either of the SMEs involved here. So uh, in case of this uh, first benefit is like, uh, you want to train your AI models uh, faster and faster, and that is the uh, use case for the HPC. And here is one application where, uh, okay, uh, which was done by the PhD student Roko Sudana. He actually graduated recently. So he is now Dr. Roko Sudana. And uh, basically he actually applied uh, this uh, uh, for the remote sensing data. And uh, he did uh, on the uh, deep CNN network and uh, did the scaling analysis with respect to the different nodes. And uh, you can, uh, most of the work is uh, done with this uh, in collaboration with Germany, and uh, he used this Joel's and the Eureka clusters for doing this project. And the other benefit of uh, HPC is like you can also do, I mean, I use uh, AI and HPC synonyms here most of the time. But uh, here is like a, you, you want to train better AI models and uh, hyper, hyperparameter tuning is one uh, active area in this uh, AI uh, field. And uh, this is uh, one use case where like uh, one of the PhD students, Shadi, has uh, used it for this, uh, 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 for uh, medical uh, data, which is in collaboration with the Germany, like a Smith, uh, uh, collab Smith project. And uh, basically he used uh, to uh, improve the accuracy of the models by uh, using this uh, hyperparameter hyper -parameter optimization. So, and this is the, like mostly I'm presenting from uh, the project from uh, different simulation and data labs in Iceland. And this is a, a other project from this large language model, like an uh, NLP model. And uh, basically uh, one of the startup which was working on it is uh, Midend. And uh, basically they are using this uh, HPC for to train this uh, uh, large language models. And uh, they use the COE res, uh, unique AI framework to train these models. And so this is a recent event happened in Iceland where the open AI representatives, it's a big event in Iceland. And uh, it's like uh, even the prime minister and the president were here actually. It was uh, the next uh, room from here. And they were here in the Groska and uh, all the Midden the representatives and open air representatives were here. And they were like uh, uh, launching the open air platform for Icelandic language. Now you can use Icelandic language and ask, sorry, you can use uh, open AI to ask uh, how to like uh, speak in Icelandic or suppose. I mean, you can type in English and it will give you an Icelandic. Even recently I used it to uh, practice my Icelandic language. So it, I, I think it's uh, reliable. And uh, okay, the last, it's, uh, I'm almost about to end this uh, uh, talk because, uh, yeah. So the last one is like, uh, this is the, uh, uh, just an advertisement of uh, what I usually do is like a, my background is uh, mostly like materials model modeling and I recently because this is uh, funded by the EuroCC2 project and I recently visited uh, Germany uh, to mostly uh, to uh, collaboration and uh, learning about uh, uh, quantum uh, mostly the D-Wave uh, quantum simulators and uh, with uh, Okay. Uh, here are some selected references regarding most of the projects from EROCC. It's like, uh, I think the slides are available later. I, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. 
and then these are some success stories and uh, some training activities most of the acti training activities are either available uh, from youtube or from like uh, from some of these uh, resources so and uh, you can also learn more of these activities in terms of the iceland from this uh, website ihpc.is uh, community website and uh, this project is uh, mostly funded fr from europe euro ju project so i think uh, i will and uh, this uh, talk i think i'm a bit uh, quick but yeah thank you very much